Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is August 28th, 2020, and uh, we could not be more excited uh, today uh, to bring you a new episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, uh, in, last month, I think it was in July, I had on the podcast uh, Shannon Caldwell Montez. Uh, Shannon uh, was raised in the LDS church, uh, was living the Mormon dream. Uh, I say that in quotes, got married, had lots of kids, and decided to go back to school to get her master's degree in history. And she decided to study B.H. Roberts. And while she was studying B.H. Roberts, she learned all sorts of really cool things that uh, not only were uh, important for the historical record and for us, but also um, she, uh, you know, started to question her Orthodox Mormon faith. So we did two major sit downs with Shannon and, uh, in those sit downs, um, we, uh, uh, we talked about her story and it's an amazing story. And I recommend that you all go back and listen to it. And then the second thing that we did was we had Shannon give us an overview of the life of B.H. Roberts. Um, and, uh, and BH Roberts is a really important figure, uh, in Mormonism for so many reasons. And we're going to be covering that a little bit again today. Um, but basically that episode was called the rise and fall of BH Roberts. Um, after that episode, there were some Mormon apologists, specifically, uh, Stephen Smoot who responded and kind of did the typical, uh, Mormon apologist attack ad hominem sort of thing where they attacked me, they attacked Mormon stories, they attacked Shannon, they attacked Shannon's scholarship. And the basic attack really was a straw man. Um, it was basically uh, saying that we were wrong in the podcast by claiming that B.H. Roberts lost his testimony in Mormonism. And I don't think that was ever the claim of either me or Shannon. What, what, the, what the episode tried to uh, discuss was it was basically discussing the rise and fall of B.H. Roberts. And then it was basically touching on the idea that, um, that eventually B.H. Roberts lost his faith in Book of Mormon historicity. And uh, because that was challenged by Stephen Smoot, what we've decided that we want to do today is go into depth uh, on this question of whether or not B.H. Roberts um, lost his testimony of the Book of Mormon, and specifically a Book of Mormon historicity. And uh, I'm going to say that uh, this is just the beginning of what I hope is a long series with Shannon, because uh, after today, we still will not have got to the core of her thesis, which was uh, an in-depth drill down on the participants of what are called uh, uh, the 1922 um, secret Mormon meetings. So that's the substance of, of Shannon's thesis. But we wanted to take a little bit of time to address this issue of B.H. Roberts and his uh, testimony and book of Mormon historicity before we dove into those secret morning meetings. So I promise you, uh, viewers and listeners, and I promise you, Shannon Caldwell Montez, that we will get to the substance of your thesis but we needed to tackle this question today. So I have a couple of people to thank before we dive in. One is Jonathan Streeter of Thinker of Thoughts. Um, Jonathan set me up with this new super slick te technology platform that we're using now where we're live streaming simultaneously to several uh, Facebook groups and pages and to YouTube. And so I want to welcome all of our listeners and viewers that are joining us live on the stream. Um, this is super cool that we could do this. And so I want to welcome you all. I want to also uh, thank my good friend, uh, Gerardo, who helped set me up with the camera, with really good lighting, so that we can kind of up the game of Mormon Stories podcast. So that's what you're seeing here is the great work of Gerardo, plus the support of Jonathan Streeter. Thanks to all of you. So today we are going to be um, discussing... Uh, it, th this is brought to you by a new YouTube channel that we're launching called Understanding Mormonism uh, with Dr. John DeLynn. Please go to that YouTube channel right now and subscribe uh, because we want to have as many subscribers as possible. This is also brought to you by Mormon Stories Podcast. 
And the topic for today, again, is did B.H. Roberts lose his testimony of the Book of Mormon with Shannon Caldwell Montes? So that is the topic of today's discussion, and we are going to um, dig in pretty soon. But before I begin, let me welcome you, Shannon Caldwell Montes, back to Mormon Stories Podcast. It's so great to see you. Thanks. Fun to be here again. How are you feeling? I don't know. <laughs> COVID and my daughter just left for college and I don't know. I don't know how I'm feeling anymore. Tell us what the reaction has been to uh, your your first couple of interviews on Mormon Stories podcast, just to bring us up to speed. I would say it's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, everyone, I've had a lot of people reach out about my personal story and tell me how well they can relate and um you know how it's i've i feel like it was a pretty normal story which is probably why so many people could relate just you know just the everyday difficulties and toxicity and things like that um and as far as the i think that there was a lot of interest in the historical aspect as well those people didn't reach out as much to me because I think those were more conversations they would have with each other and, you know, just the theories and thinking about it and talking about it. But it has been interesting to see what apologists say about it as well. So I think it's brought about some really interesting conversation. Totally agree. Um, and that's what we're going to dig into today. So, Today, we are going to answer uh, the question, you know, did B.H. Roberts lose his testimony of the Book of Mormon? Well, I don't think we're going to answer that question. Why don't you go ahead and give your disclaimer about whether that that question is really answerable? Yeah, I mean, it's something that that's one uh, criticism that people have given me that, you know, I didn't really address all the things that he said afterwards and whether or not his testimony, main, he maintained it. A belief in historicity and I've made the point this is not first of all that was never the point of my thesis my thesis was to discover these meetings and to talk about who that who they were and what happened and why they were important so that that was the point of my thesis was to uncover and discover these series of meetings um, so talking about BH Roberts testimony is out of the scope of my thesis it, it, like to decide what somebody believed would be a ridiculous thing to put to make as a thesis because you can never prove what one person's ultimate beliefs are. But that said, in the course of my research, I found a lot of um, things that would point me towards the idea that he no longer had a belief in historicity. Um, again, I'm not going to make a firm stand on that as a historian because you can't know somebody's mind. But when I look at evidence and quotes and other testimony, I do believe there was um, a strong hit on his belief in historicity. Absolutely. Um, uh, there, there are some listeners asking where where's the link to the thesis. Um, that is uh, that is from Amy Azizi. Where is the link to the thesis? Amy, uh, we put a link to uh, the thesis in the description of this episode. So whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on Facebook, whichever post you're accessing it from, you can find a link uh, to the thesis there. And if one of you um, who's online wants to share the link. You can also just Google it. Just Google Secret Mormon Meetings of 1922. It's... it's right there top of the results. So easy yeah. to find. And I will, I will actually share that now in the stream as well for anyone who wants to access it. Um, okay. This is so slick, this software that we're using. All right. So even though we can't know if BH, Ro we can't know if BH Roberts totally lost his testimony, you know, in either the book of Mormon or in uh, the LDS church overall, I think we can, th there's a lot of evidence that, that provides a compelling case, um, that he certainly lost his testimony of Book of Mormon historicity. And I think that's what we're going to, we're going to cover now. Um, yeah. is that all right, Shannon? Yeah. And again, this isn't my thesis, so I don't have this as well documented, but I do, I have spent the last day or so 
trying to gather the sources that I had looked at that would lead me to that conclusion. So again, a little bit of a disclaimer that I may not have this all tidied up. I'm going to just for fun, add a comment from Frederick Willis. Frederick writes, Shannon, my wife was incredibly moved by your story. And so was I, thank you for sharing. Aww. Um, that's just Aww. one of, of many people. Um, Al writes, Shannon, thank you for your time and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Um, Kellerin, Kellerin writes, just want to say an upfront, huge thanks to Shannon for standing up for basic academic honesty mm -hmm. and integrity. <laughs> so we love the comments from the listeners. Uh, please keep them coming. Let's now dig into the substance of today's presentation. Did B.H. Roberts lose his testimony of the Book of Mormon? So I'm going to provide a little bit of a background. And Shannon, I'm going to ask you to jump in whenever you want. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. So B.H. Roberts, just as a background, was born in 1857. He was a Utah politician. Um, he was LDS church historian. He was a general authority for the church. Um He's not an apostle, but he was in the Quorum of the Seventy. Talk quickly, Shannon, about why what it meant to be in the Seventy was maybe a little bit different than, than what it means today relative to an apostle. Um, yeah, they just were more on par with an apostle. There was a change in the, I believe it was late 1920s, where they were kind of battling out who, who got, like, the biggest say <laughs> in things and who reported to who. And um, the apostles ended up winning that argument. But at the time, the 70s, and especially the presidency of the 70s, which Roberts was, was on par with an apostle. People probably would have known him as well as they, as people today know an apostle. Absolutely. And, and as you read about the history, uh, both in your wonderful thesis and in several other articles that I've been reading on dialogue and elsewhere. Um, Roberts is working super closely with Talmadge, with Ivans, uh, with Lyman, with all these apostles. He's just working. In fact, you know, Grant delegates this job to Roberts right. you know, he, or, or at least, you know, to Talmadge and then Talmadge to Roberts. And so clearly Roberts was a super important player. Yeah. In, he was considered the top apologist. I, I was looking yesterday at a letter from Heber J. Grant to one of Roberts's friends, Isaac Russell, and he was saying, yeah, B.H. Roberts is probably our top apologist and the greatest defender, and he's, you know, one of the best scholars we have. So he was definitely well-respected. Absolutely. Okay, so back to our, uh, back to our discussion of Roberts. Um, he died in 1933, uh, which we'll talk talk about at the very end of this presentation, but that's kind of a brief overview. I went ahead and gathered just some of the publications that Roberts released relative to Book of Mormon historicity. So in 1895, he releases A New Witness for God. And then between 1902 and 1932, he releases A History of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in seven volumes. 1909, he releases New Witnesses for God volumes two and three. Both of them uh, diving deep into the Book of Mormon. And then from 1907 to 1912, he publishes something called Defense of the Faith and the Saints in two volumes. So like you said, totally into defending uh, the Book of Mormon. And this is important because one of the things apologists like to do is quote stuff that he wrote before 1922 as examples of him not losing his faith. Is that, exactly. do I have that right, Shannon? Right. Yeah. If you look at the apologetic articles, especially before the papers came out, they were basically pulling tons of quotes from before 1922 to talk about how much he was, how much he believed, how strongly he felt that it was defendable, um, just how absolute his belief was. But that was pretty much always from 1922. To I'm um, before 1922. Exactly. So if you want to know what B.H. Roberts believed at the end of his life about the Book of Mormon and its historicity, you can't really look at anything before 1921 because 1921 was when uh, the church kind of heard this shot, heard around the world for the church that we're going to talk about in uh, right now, basically. So one thing that I wanted to highlight is just this super, I'm going to begin and I'm going to end with this quote 
that comes from New Witnesses for God, Volume 2, again, written in 1909. This is B.H. Roberts. And you're going to have to just forgive us because we're going to dive in, show the work, as Dr. Robert Rittner encourages us to do um, from a previous Mormon Stories episode, the great Robert Rittner. And we're going to read some quotes. So uh, here I go. This is B.H. Roberts in 1909. If the origin of the Book of Mormon could be proved to be other than that set forth by Joseph Smith, if the book itself could be proved to be other than it claims to be, which is a translation of ancient, you know, golden plates, right? Then the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its message and doctrines must fall. For if that book is other than it claims to be, again, a translation of golden plates uh, delivered by an angel to Joseph Smith. Um, um, yeah, if... If the book is other than claims to be, then the church, um, for if that book is other than claims to be, if its origins is other than that ascribed to it by Joseph Smith, then Joseph Smith says that which is untrue. He is a false prophet of false prophets, and all he taught and all his claims to inspiration and divine authority are not only vain, but wicked. And all that he did as a religious teacher is not only useless, but mischievous beyond human comprehending. So I, I, I start with that quote because this is B.H. Roberts basically saying, he's basically laying down the gauntlet here and saying, if Joseph Smith, if the Book of Mormon isn't exactly what Joseph Smith claims to be, a translation of ancient records, golden plates delivered to him by, by Mormon, then uh, it's all a fraud. And that's going to come in later, but I just want you to keep that in your minds as you're hearing the rest of this presentation. I will continue to another paragraph. Again, New Witnesses for God, Volume 2, 1909. Those who accept the Book of Mormon for what it claims to be may not so state their case that its security chiefly rests on the inability of its opponents to prove a negative. Uh, this is basically talking about apologists and the burden of proof that apologists must show when they're defending the Book of Mormon. He writes... The affirmative side of the question belongs to us who hold out the Book of Mormon to the world as a revelation of God. The burden of proof rests upon us in every discussion, for not only must the Book of Mormon not be proved to have other origin than that which we set forth, or be other than what we say it is, but we must prove its origin to be what we say it is, and the book itself to be what we proclaim it to be, a revelation of from God to be known, the truth must be stated, and the clear and more complete the statement is, the better opportunity will the Holy Spirit have for testifying to the souls of men that the work is true. Now, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because even though we can call B. H. Roberts an apologist, he is not a he is not a 21st century Mormon apologist in the sense that he had integrity. And he basically said it's not good enough just to come up with vapid, uh, irrelevant, pseudo-scientific answers that just pr provide plausible deniability that perhaps the Book of Mormon could be true in some vague sense. He's basically saying it's beholden on Mormon apologists to demonstrate beyond any reasonable shadow of a doubt that the Book of Mormon affirmingly in truth, really is what it claims. Do you want to add anything to that, Shannon? Yeah, I just, I think it's remarkable, his confidence. I think it kind of shows that current leaders probably don't believe the way he did. They don't, they probably know that they can't make such a bold statement as he did at that time. They're not going to say, oh, you can't prove you know, we have to prove that it's true. They're saying you can't prove that it's false, like he was saying you can't do. But um, you just don't hear that kind of challenge anymore. And I think that's because they know it can't be challenged in that way. Absolutely. So so having set that bar really high, and again, these are B.H. Roberts' own words, uh, the next thing I want to... Uh, you know, discuss is um, an article that I'd stumble on this morning from Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, Volume 29, Number 2, Summer of 19, 1996. And it's a book, uh, it's an article that's called Mr. Couch and Elder Roberts. And this is by Richard F. Keeler, and it tells the story 
of how all of this hubbub came to be starting in 1921. Um, and so uh, what we learned about from this article is that there was a man named Dr. Uh, James F. Couch. He was born in Massachusetts. Uh, he went to Harvard, got a bachelor's degree from Harvard in 1913. He went on to get a PhD from American University by 1926. But during that time, he was uh, working on his graduate work. He uh, And after, he worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, the USDA. And uh, just to sort of round out the credibility of Dr. Couch, uh, this article says that by the end of his career, Couch was, quote, senior author of about 90 scientific papers, mostly focused on poisonous plants and toxins. Now, this is all fine and good, but what in the heck does it have to do with B.H. Roberts? Well, here's what it has to do with B.H. Roberts. So um, James F. Couch was conducting for the, um, for the United States government um, research on poisonous plants at the U.S. Experiment Station in Gooseberry Canyon near Salina, Utah, in the summers of, of the years leading up to 1921. And while he was working in Salina, Utah, he met a, a young student from uh, what was then Utah State Agricultural College, which is now Utah State University, called William Emerson Ryder, who was studying botany and in fact got his bachelor's degree in botany in 1922 from what became Utah State University. And I think, I think, you tell me if I'm wrong, Shannon, but it sounds like um, Ryder basically shares the Book of Mormon with Couch. Is that is that kind of your understanding? Yeah, I think he was being a good little missionary and, you know, telling him to read the Book of Mormon and, you know, how great it is. And I think Ryder, or I think Couch was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> and, and I'm sure like if, if Heavenly Father, the Mormon Heavenly Father could go back in time, as soon as, you know, as soon as Ryder was about to share uh, the Book of Mormon <laughs> with Couch, Heavenly Father would have gone, no, you know, <laughs> please don't share the Book of Mormon with James Couch. Because what James, uh, F, Dr. James F. Couch did is he read the Book of Mormon and he read it from, uh, he must have read it from cover to cover because what he did is he came up with five major scientific problems with uh, the Book of Mormon. And he gave those to William Ryder. And then William Ryder writes a letter um, to LDS apostle and scientist James E. Talmadge on August 22nd, 1921. Um, and then apparently, and you write this in your wonderful thesis, what does Talmadge do when he gets the letter? He ignores it. <laughs> he kind of as ignores it. Can tell, it seems that he ignored it the first time. And then couch or writer writes him a second letter about a month later and says, Hey, I'm waiting on an answer. And I think it's at that point that Talmadge hands it off to BH Roberts and says, I don't know what to do with this. You handle it. Yeah. And tell me if I'm wrong, but what I read from your thesis is writer ends up writing Talmadge three times in one year. Yeah. Saying, what the freak? Where's my answer? And then like a month later, he, um, he writes him again and then BH Roberts, it's the end of December, the third time he writes, and B.H. Roberts writes back and says, hey, I'm going to handle this, but I need a little more time. And then right. he writes to Heber J. Grant and says, uh, help. <laughs> we, need to, we, have, we need to have a meeting because I have these questions that are more problematic than I had originally anticipated. And I just, I just have to note how freaking awesome, number one, James F. Couch was for reading the Book of Mormon, taking it seriously, and coming up with these scientific questions. And then how freaking ninja William Ryder is to hassle a Mormon apostle three times <laughs> in like a span of like eight or nine months, tenaciously saying, I need my freaking answers. Yeah. Where are my freaking answers, right? Well, we know he actually wrote at least one more time. So at the yeah. end of all this. So he he was pretty, pretty tenacious. Super tenacious and basically a ninja, a legend. So... We've got James F. Couch, a senior chemist for the USDA, writing William Ryder or, or, or giving questions to William Ryder. William Ryder writes James E. Talmadge. And these are the five questions from James F. Couch uh, to, you know, the LDS church through, um, through Talmadge. Question number one, and these are summarized. Number one, 
if the Nephites, and this is just so profound, Shannon, because what we're going to find out today, and this is just, this blows my mind in 2020. I'm just learning about this stuff now. You know, so many, the majority of Mormons in the world have never even heard of Beach Roberts. They've never heard of any of these problems of the Book of Mormon. They've never heard of Mormon stories. They've never heard of CES letter. Like they're ignorant to all this stuff, right? Yeah. So me, I've been studying this stuff 20 years. I'm just now at age 51 in 2020 digging into this stuff. But what I want you guys all to think about is, is for how long these issues have been discussed unbeknownst to all of us and under full awareness of the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 and the quorum of the 70. We're going to go back a hundred years to demonstrate that this stuff has been known and, and uh, contemplated and avoided and ignored by Mormon church leaders for over a hundred years. So here are, here are the five questions that Couch writes to the LDS church. Number one, if the Nephites populated the Americas knowing Hebrew, okay, so so that's, you know, Nephi and, and Le Lehi, certainly they're Jews, there's Israelis, they come over to America, certainly they know and speak Hebrew, and apparently they also know and know how to write Egyptian, right? If they come over here, 600 BC, um, knowing Hebrew, there's no way that five distinct linguistic stocks of Native American language could have developed in only 2,700 years. So just to kind of, re do you want to restate that, Shannon? <laughs> yeah, languages, especially stable languages such as Hebrew have, they take a long time to change. I mean, you'll have like little, little, words here and there that change but to to become an entirely different language stock we're talking like german and french are from similar language stock but you know for them to become so different takes thousands and thousands of years absolutely so so you wouldn't find number one i think it's it's, it's just obvious if you come if, if you discover native americans in in the 1400s or 1500s if they had all started, you know, uh, however many years previously, speaking Hebrew, writing Egyptian, you would have remnants of Hebrew and Egyptian in their language. You know, Latin right. root, just like English has Latin roots, um, you know, you would expect whatever languages Native Americans were speaking, you know, for those languages to have either Egyptian or Hebrew roots. Um, but you would also not expect five major linguistic stocks or strands of languages to have to have developed in only 27 yeah, years. Yeah, and they're not similar. We're not talking about like French and German. We're talking about like Japanese and German, right? They're not, they're different language stocks. They're from different sources. Right. So that's the first problem, just the linguistics of it. The second problem that uh, Couch poses to the, to the LDS church is horses. Why in the freak are horses mentioned in the Book of Mormon when we know absolutely through science that there were zero horses during the Book of Mormon times in Mesoamerica or in North America or in South America? And, and of course, uh, Michael Coe in a previous Mormon Stories interview, uh, you know, verifies that and validates it. And of course, when the explorers came over, uh, you know, to the Americas in the 14 to 1500s, they brought the horses and there's no evidence of them ever finding a single Native American ever sitting on a horse. Uh, right. Anything you want to add of there? The art shows that um, there's the horses when they came, they changed the continent so completely that there's just no way some tiny band of um, people had horses and chariots and kept it under wraps. It, it's like a disruptive technology it would have made them so powerful and everyone would have wanted it. There's just no way that somebody had horses and was using them and kept it secret. Yeah. And, and frankly, if the native Americans had had horses, the Spanish would have never been able to defeat them. <laughs> Probably. Right? Well, mean, steel as well. Right, steel right, right. Another thing. Right. So that takes us to uh, concern number three that, that couch presents to Talmuds in the LDS church that Nephi used a bow of steel but the Jews in 600 BC did not know how to make steel. And that doesn't even mention 
uh, the many instances in the text of the Book of Mormon where where Nephites and Lamanites are are dealing with swords and steel swords, etc. There just wasn't metallurgy creating weapons um, in in the Americas um, during during the Mesoamerican times of the Book of Mormon. Correct, right. Shannon. Right. Something that could, as we were saying before, something that could chop off an arm would. It just did not exist, especially or chop 40 off arms. dozens of arms, right? Yeah, dozens of arms in a row. Like there was not that kind of technology. Most of the wars, they were would injure each other. They wouldn't kill each other. So it was a different, completely different technology they had. Brilliant. Okay, problem number four um, from Couch is the Book of Mormon frequently uses the word scimitar but both the weapon and the term were developed post-Christianity. In other words, why in the freak is Joseph Smith, um, or why is, the, why is the word scimitar at all appearing in the Book of Mormon when scimitars were developed sort of, as I understand it, by Muslim nations sort of 600 AD afterwards, and there's no way that 600 BC, um, you know, Nephi or Lehi or whoever, or his descendants, their descendants, would ever be even using the word scimitar um, because the weapon or the word didn't exist until a hundred plus a thousand plus years later. And by the way, um, you know, if, if the Lord can reveal to Nephi words like Kurlom and Kumamom or whatever those weird words are, certainly the Lord could give Nephi a proper word and not use the word scimitar. Any thoughts you want to add to that, Shannon? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's hilarious. It's like, you know, Abe Lincoln saying Abe Lincoln was talking about using a cell phone. Like it's not, it's, it doesn't make sense because there was no such thing at that time, even in the world, no matter where it was, but for it to show up on a different continent before it was ever invented. And yeah, there could have been other words, made up words used, but they're using the word that has use, but later. I'm grateful for the comments that are rolling in on social media, which validates our our uh, decision to use this wonderful platform uh, called StreamYard. Kellerin writes, correction, there was some metallurgy used for weapon making, but they were largely ceremonial and nowhere near what we would call a steel sword. So thanks, Kellerin. Right. For, Most uh, of the metal us- was um, for decoration. They did have like gold, but they were like softer metals there was no need for the hardened metal. We didn't have bursts of be- beasts of burden to pull wagons and things. It was just, they had sufficient for their needs and they didn't need the hardened steel that came about later on another continent. Absolutely. And then the final thing that was mentioned uh, by Couch is the Book of Mormon mentioned silk, but silk was not known in the Americas during that era. And again, we have Michael Coe on Mormon stories you know, the Yale Mesoamerican anthropologist validating that, in fact, Native Americans never had steel, uh, never had silk um, uh, during that time period. And so there's no reason that the Book of Mormon should ever mention silk. Um, right. Okay, so. And that doesn't even, well, yeah, that doesn't even get uh, into the things that it should mention that it doesn't, you know, like the normal foods they would eat or. Oh, chocolate like that, and turkeys but, and, you know, yeah, yeah. like if you want an amazing Mormon stories episode, go listen to the Michael Co. the two interviews I do with Michael Co. It's spelled C O E. Um, he just devastates the book of Mormon from a archeological <laughs> anthropological perspective. And he just goes into depth about all the things that, that, that the book of Mormon mentions that, that shouldn't be there. Wheat, barley, steel, uh, horses, uh, chariots, you know, uh, just a million different things. And then he talks about all the things that should be in the more book of Mormon that aren't like chocolate and turkeys and corn and tomatoes and all the things that we know native Americans had that the Europeans didn't. So, right. so he uh, had couch had good enough questions. He didn't ask yeah. all the questions, no. but he had yeah, great I, these, questions, but these five are pretty good, right? Yeah. They're, they're enough. I mean, we don't need to keep proving the same point. Yeah. But it's in 1921 that's so mind-blowing here. Okay, yeah. so Talmadge can't, you know, by the by this time, Talmadge has sort of given up on science. He's become a full-blown apologist in, in my reading of where he uh, turns out on this. So he punts this to B.H. Roberts, who's general authority and church historian. And um, I, I, I want to push back oh, for just please. a second 
Go ahead. on Talmadge. I think Talmadge, he still respected science. He, he didn't, I, if we're talking about scientists giving up science for this, I think Widso would be the person that we talk about who basically abandoned science and said, well, religion matters more and kind of stopped worrying about science. Talmadge was a little more conflicted. He was later talking about how the age of the earth had to be older than 6,000 years. So he was more on B.H. Roberts' team here as far as um, trying to use science in order to further their case. But I just think he punted it to B.H. Roberts because Roberts had already done a lot of this research in his previous book. Yeah, and admittedly, I'm a little bit salty at at um, Talmadge because I I know he's a hero in in so many ways. I know he deserves respect. I, I think one of the um, one of the quotes from your thesis that kind of got me a little bit upset uh, with him um, was when he wrote. Um, well, we're going to get to it in a second. We're going to get to it in a second. I'm explain why I'm a little bit salty. At, at I think time. I think he supported his son pushing back. I there's I talk about this in my thesis. There's an episode where his son is pushing back against Joseph Field, Fielding Smith, and I think Talmadge is like, yeah, I totally agree, but you have to say it. I can't because he's my superior. Basically. Which which in and of itself is so fascinating. And you yeah. talk about this again in your thesis that. Mormon seniority is so important, just apostolic seniority right. that even though, even though, um, you know, Talmadge was just called slightly after, um, Joseph Fielding Smith, right? Right. And Joseph Fielding Smith was called as an apostle via nepotism through his dad, Joseph F. Smith. Yeah. Right? At like 32, I think. Some but, but because, age. but because Joseph Fielding Smith had like a year on Talmadge, Talmadge had to continually defer and had to, had to sort of fight battles with Joseph Fielding Smith through his son, which is a whole mm -hmm. level of weird, distorted politics. It had to be an indirect thing because he couldn't like directly yeah. oppose him because of the promises he made, I'm guessing. And yeah, I mean, it goes down to like who gets to leave and enter a room and who, who the eats order the they chocolates speak first, in. right? Yeah, it's, it's like seniority is everything. Yeah. Okay, so, so Talmadge Punster Roberts. And then I love this quote from your, from, I got this quote from George Smith. So there's so many amazing articles out of dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought that you can find on, on BH Roberts. This one's from George D Smith, a 1996 uh, dialogue article called, is there any way to escape these difficulties? The book of Mormon studies of BH Roberts. And he writes, while knowing that some parts of my treatment of book of Mormon problems Oh, by the way, this is B.H. Roberts. So this is B.H. Roberts quoted in George D. Smith's article. So Roberts says, quote, while knowing that some parts of my treatment of Book of Mormon problems in that work, meaning New Witnesses for God, the book I referred to earlier, had not been altogether as convincing as I would have liked to have had them, I still believe that reasonable explanations could be made regarding the Book of Mormon. But as I proceeded with my recent investigations, I found the difficulties more serious than I had thought. So what, what does this demonstrate to you, Shannon Caldwell Montez? Yeah, this is so this is the letter that B.H. Roberts wrote to the First Presidency saying, hey, we need to have a meeting. And he's saying, these answers are not good. Like, I thought I had answered this. And when I look closer, I did not answer it. And the sources I used were not great. So I need your help. Absolutely. And then I was, I, and so, and so what, what happened next is that, that starting in late 1921, and you tell me if I'm wrong, Robert starts writing these, um, these manuscripts that we referred to in our last episode, but neither of us were ready to sort of dig in at this level and so uh, on a tip from my friend Gerardo, I decided that we're going to dig in a little bit to these manuscripts today and discuss them a little bit more in detail. Do you want to give us just an overview again of these manuscripts before we actually dig into them, Shannon? Sure. So the first one is called... Right, here, oh, 
let, let me go ahead and pull it up because I've actually, so just give, before we talk about each one individually, just give an overview of kind of what, what happened and what Roberts decided to do. So yeah, he started to explore the subject more. And I personally think it started about a year earlier and we can go into this later, but they had a, set, a series of meetings to determine the Book of Mormon geography. And that was in 19. Okay, so talk about those, those are the geography meetings of 21, right? Yeah, 1921, they, um, they were actually putting out a new edition of the Book of Mormon. And so there were a lot of committee meetings deciding several things. For example, B.H. Roberts was able to get them to update some of the grammar that was a little folksy, um, such as I was going a thither or we were a journeying, things like that. He got those taken out and replaced with more formal English. Um, but as part of this process of updating the 1920 edition of the Book of Mormon, they were thinking of putting in a map of Book of Mormon lands. And as they tried to pin it down, they started to realize that um, the dimensions that are mentioned in the Book of Mormons, you know, saying, we, oh, we went across from here to across the entire land in two days, or I can't remember the details, but it was like, oh, we are limited by what the Book of Mormon says to a space this large. They started to realize that they couldn't have the entire Book of Mormon be from North to South America, East to West, that it wasn't the entire continent, that that wouldn't work based on what the book said. So they had these meetings to try to determine where this could be. And I think actually these meetings were the first time they acknowledged that the Book of Mormon put a limit on the size of Book of Mormon lands. So I think this kind of like uh, surprised Roberts and was like, oh shoot, Huh. And so I kind of feel like this topic was already on his mind before Couch started, before Couch and Ryder sent these letters to him to ask for questions. So I think this is something that was kind of brewing for him before then. So I think he thought about it for a year, but then in December he gets these letters and he's like, oh, here's the chance to actually put this down and to answer these questions. Obviously, I'm not the only one wondering about this. Let's, let's get these answered. And so he starts writing this and he ends up with 400 pages, 421 pages, I believe, of, um, of material to kind of support that uh, our historicity issues are a little bit suspect. <laughs> I have a quick question from Alan Mount, our dear friend, Alan, who runs Marriage on a Tightrope podcast. He asked, does anyone have the full quote on hand? Ellipses always make me nervous. Thank you, Alan, for keeping us honest. Alan, I just posted to a link um, to George Smith's article in Dialogue called, Is There Any Way to Escape These Difficulties? And that will provide you with all the uh, all the primary sources and all the references, and we can provide more you of that also later. You can find the full letters in the, in, the ba in the back, the appendix of my thesis. So I have like the, that full letter that, Robert sent to the first presidency asking for this um, meeting and the one afterward where he talks about his disappointment in the meeting. So those kind of things can be found in my thesis as well, as well as they're all in the studies of the Book of Mormon, this book that's published <laughs> by, um, that has the full, all of the papers, the entire papers that they found and published. So those are all there as well. Excellent. Okay. So, so these Book of Mormon geography meetings lead, uh, sort of give BH Roberts a head start. But certainly, once he gets this letter, um, you know, from Couch, he starts to, to study and write more in haste. Is that right, Shannon? Yes. Yeah. He, um, I think, yeah, I think he put this together pretty quickly and uh, had, a I think he probably gathered some of the stuff he'd already written in 1909 and then added to it. So a lot of it's kind of just cutting and pasting what he had, all his materials, but he did have this 400 plus page document that he presented in January, on January 4th and 5th of 1922. Okay. And how many, so, so let's go ahead and talk about, 
um, the manuscripts themselves, and we'll go into depth on each of the three manuscripts. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So what I have, and, and there's a couple bullets on here that need to be edited, but let's just talk about it generally. Manuscript number one, we're going to call Book of Mormon Difficulties a Study. Now, how many pages was that Was that document, Shannon? Well, it looks like you said 291. I don't remember then. <laughs> That's, for some reason, I was thinking it was 420, and then or maybe the 420 was both of them together. Um, okay. Oh, I'm yeah, gonna... right. It's 141 pages, typed pages. Okay. So, and, and I, I only put a question mark there because I, I, I think depending on how you count the pages, I found some, some other reports of the number of pages. So around, yeah, it's, it's fair to say around 140 pages, right? That's where I was. Yeah. The one was 141 typed pages. The okay. first one called Book of Mormon Difficulties, a study. Okay. So in Book of Mormon Difficulties, a study, um, Basically, B.H. Roberts talks about three main things. He talks about the linguistic problems. He gives his best assessment of the linguistic problems. He talks about um, what Thomas Alexander summarized as physical culture. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically describe that as anachronisms. So that's basically the problems with horses and steel. All the things that the CES letter and Michael Coe bring out, the Mormon stories brought out that are causing you know, Mormons in 2020 to lose their mind and to lose their faith. B.H. Roberts was telling uh, the first presidents of the Quorum of the Twelve and the Quorum of the Seventy about these anachronisms back in 1922. So everyone was put on notice about those problems in the Book of Mormon from Manuscript 1, the Book of Mormon Difficulties. And then the third thing that is brought up is the racial origins of Native Americans. Now, of course, we didn't have DNA studies back mm -hmm. then, but back then, it was pretty obvious to archaeologists and anthropologists that likely Native Americans came from Asia, not from Israel. Anything you want to add to that, um, Shannon? Right. I think he's, yeah, he's like, back then when Joseph Smith was writing this, everyone believed there was this um, 10 tribes thing where a, some of the lost tribes came across. And that that was kind of what view of the Hebrews was about. Um, but th it was a common belief in like early America or, you know, post-revolution that the, the natives are, are a lost tribe from the 10 tribes. So that was kind of the prevailing idea. But as time, as the years passed, they, the new idea was that there was the land bridge from Asia and that was how this continent was peopled. Love it. A couple of comments from our listeners that are just too fun not to post. RB writes, when is the Book of Mormon Archaeological Museum going to open? <laughs> uh, right. Thank you. <laughs> I remember thank you. being a little kid and being like, isn't there a museum we could go to see the Book of Mormon, the gold plates? I remember asking my mom, like, where can I go see those? And she was like, oh, an angel took them back. And I was like, oh, dang, that's <laughs> too bad. <laughs> um, Stock and Barrel writes, uh, John, video quality looking uh, okay. That's, uh, again, thanks to Gerardo for his support on that. Um, all right. So, uh, so going back to the description of Manuscript 1 or Book of Mormon Difficulties of Study, it's pretty clear that that uh, that Roberts wrote this to present to the church um, during the 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 big meetings that happened in January of 1922. So I have a quick quote here again from your thesis. It says, however, as Roberts proceeded with his investigations, he found the difficulties more serious, quote, more serious than I had thought, quote, meaning Roberts, and quote, Again, Roberts, the more I investigated, the more difficult I the more difficulty I found, the more difficult I found the formulation of an answer to Mrs. Couch, Mr. Couch's inquiries to be, close quote. Then you write, Shannon, as he researched, expanding on the questions, Roberts decided he should not answer without the input of others. What do you, why do you think he decided to loop in the first presidency quorum of the 12 of the quorum of the 70 and didn't just respond um, himself? Uh, Shannon Caldwell Montez. Uh, because the questions were too difficult. And he said, 
um, in the letter, like, I think we need to do this from our collective wisdom and from something about like the spirit, you know, of revelation, like hopefully if we all get together, God's going to help us come up with an answer here because it's more than I can handle. Yeah. I, and I have to think that at minimum, he felt like there was a lot at stake. Like if he wrote some lame answer that then got published, you know, I don't know, in the New York Times, just like the Book of Abraham stuff had been published in, I don't know, 1912 or whatever, like that could be really embarrassing for the church. But it sounds like what you're saying is maybe he still had some earnest faith in the prophetic mantle and that he was looking to the general authorities, to the apostles, to the prophet, to the first presidency as people that, that could use their inspiration to help him get answers, right? Right. He was a true believer. I really, he believed in revelation and inspiration and he believed this and he thought that they would, together they could conquer anything. And that's super important because later we're going to talk about his disappointment with the <laughs> brethren, right? Yeah. So, so Talmadge goes to Roberts and then Roberts goes to Heber J. Grant, right? Right. And this leads to the January 1922 meetings. This is something we talked about, you know, with you before, Shannon. These are held in Salt Lake City. Who are the attendees, Shannon? All of the 12 apostles, uh, the first presidency, and the quorum of the 70s. So basically every general authority. In the world. Know, that existed, yeah. And, and it wasn't just two days. It was three full days, right? Right. Yeah. So the first two days were Roberts making his presentation of his uh, his document, the, the first document that deals with the external and scientific issues. I, I believe the third day was more um, a discussion with um, Ivans, who, who was one of the people who was in this geography meeting and therefore had some knowledge about Book of Mormon lands. Um, I think the third meeting was more of a discussion and partially a rebuttal. And I think after that third meeting, a lot of the brethren were kind of like, oh, okay, cool. Ivan's, I like Ivan's answers. We'll be fine. Because he had some plausibilities that people were fine with. Right. And this is, I just can't, th there needs to be a documentary written about these meetings and, and the, the history before and after, like somebody needs to write a screenplay. Everybody <laughs> wants like a Mormon going clear. We know that a couple of friends of mine are working on a, a Netflix documentary on Mark Hoffman, which is going to be amazing. What we really need is a documentary, not a documentary, but like a historical feature length film on BH Roberts and this whole situation and this meeting and what came before and the aftermath. Cause it's, it's really got to be a pivotal moment in Mormon history that no one freaking knows about. Is that fair right. to say? But that's what I think. That's why I was like, so proud of myself when I wrote this thesis. Cause I was like, wait, what, why are we talking about the fact that all of the general authorities were put on notice in 1922? Like this is, this seems like a big deal. And they say, it seemed to just kind of be glossed over even when the papers came out. I think the papers were so exciting that they were only talking about the papers. And you know, me coming along 30 years after that discussion, I'm like, but wait, what about those meetings? Let's, let's learn more about that. And that, that's why I was surprised people hadn't delved into this. So I decided I better do it. And, and, I just want to say you are freaking brilliant, Shannon Caldwell Montez. But if you go back into the 80s and 90s with Dialogue of General Mormon Thought, you'll have top-notch historians talking in detail about these meetings and the aftermath and what came before. And what's so mind-boggling and frustrating about Mormonism and Mormon history is how history, intellectual history goes down the memory hole and generation mm -hmm. across generation Either this information doesn't penetrate the public consciousness or it gets freaking completely forgotten by the members. And so most right. members to this date have never learned any of this stuff. But even though there was a massive upsurge in research about B.H. Roberts in the 80s and 90s, of course, as the Roberts manuscripts are published, it then dies down. And then you've got new generations that have never heard of this stuff again. And that's something right. that is just killing me. We've got to do a better job of penetrating Mormon consciousness with the truth about Mormon history 
So this stuff doesn't keep getting lost generation across generation. Right. Well, I think what happened in the past was that it, this was talked about among intellectuals, but the church says, don't go to Sunstone, don't pick up dialogue, don't, don't do these things. And so they were, able, and I think, I'm not sure, but it seems like the September 6th may have been the first major excommunication for intellectual reasons. I don't think they were doing that very much in the past. I think they were generally just left Von alone. Brody, Von Brody. Yeah. I think Juanita Brooks was maybe threatened, but didn't end up getting excommunicated. Sterling right. McMurrin was kind of threatened. But yeah, you're right. There weren't right, a lot of... Like right after that. So, you know, Mark Hoffman, this all came out right before the bombing. So I think it was a big deal. But then the bombing happened. And that was like huge <laughs> and traumatic. And I just don't think it really got picked up again after that. And there was no internet. So, you know, these, we're not going to go find it on a message board. I just think, and a lot of those people who at the time were still Mormons, I'm reading like George Smith talking about how we need a halfway covenant so that people that aren't full believers can still be members and like be seen as okay. He's talking about that in the 1980s saying, you know, we should, we should be able to have intellectuals, non-literal believers and literal believers in the same group. But it seems like since that time, there was kind of a crackdown in trying to push out non-literal believers. Absolutely. So those people weren't there to bring up the next generation. And I guess it was a good tactic because it did, it worked. Like there was no next generation of intellectuals coming up. They would just leave. Yeah. Until as, 2000. As still the case. Until 2004, 2005, when the internet comes on blogging and then podcasting, Mormon podcasting starts. And then, you know, you know, there's Mormon stories, then there's Mormon think, then there's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more Mormon expression with John Larson. Then there's, uh, you know, Jeremy, Jeremy Runnels CES letter. And, you know, now we've got Radio Free Mormon and, and the Jansen Park, uh, you know, yeah. your polygamy. And my call to all of you is the call to this generation is to make the truth about Mormon history pervasive within broad Mormon consciousness. Because the scholarships, so much of it's already been done. Like mm -hmm. Shannon and I are just like, whoa, this is amazing. This is cool. Mostly Shannon, but then Shannon helps me learn about it. But then I dig back the dialogue and like there's articles and articles and articles about this stuff that we yeah. just don't know. It's anything already about. been said. Like yeah. we, this conversation's already been had. And like all the things that you're wondering, and it's all out there. Like yeah. it's already there. And that's why, again, this wasn't part of my thesis because this whole portion, 1985 and on when the papers came to light and all of these intellectual discussions were happening, you know, that's 60 years after the main period of my paper. And it just didn't really work to talk about both of those things. Sure. So I ended up cutting yeah. that, even though I, I did write about 50 pages of that history, the 1980s and all the dialogue happening between apologists. Can you, and, share and, with that? Can you share that with us at some point? <laughs> yeah. I, I was thinking of maybe putting out an article or something, but um, cause it gets a little, it's a little heavy just talking about the back and forth that you have to be pretty interested to want to read it. <laughs> Couple quick questions. So actually comments, Joel Hernandez writes, love the studio. Thanks, Joel. Trent writes, are there minutes from those meetings? So from the secret 1922 mm -hmm. meetings, Shannon Caldo Montes, were minutes kept and do those minutes exist? I'm sure they do, but they are not allowed to be seen. I asked for those and they laughed at me, honestly. They who were did? like- Who'd you ask and who laughed? Um, I asked the employees at the church history library. I was like, can I see the first presidency meetings from- uh, minutes from these meetings and they were like, yeah, right. <laughs> You're never going to, those things are definitely top secret off limits. So no, but I did, I was actually just reading last night um, an article that uh, James Allen, I think wrote about the way the truth, the light, um, which was a BH Roberts manuscript, truth, right? the way the light, I always get it wrong order. Um, it's like his final magnum opus on Mormon theology. Right. Yeah. And in the footnotes, he talks about getting um, access 
to first presidency minutes and like all of these, he like lists all the document, not the actual documents, but the types of things he got. And he's like, and I'm just gonna call it the TWL collection. But I was like, oh, I wanted that TWL collection so bad, but because I wasn't, you know, a full-time paid employee who'd been vetted by the church, there was no way they were letting me have that. Yeah, which is dishonest. Uh, open up the record. I think so. I think so. All right. Uh, Taryn writes, is Shannon related to B.H. Roberts or have a connection to him somehow? Nope. No. I just thought he was interesting. Yeah, he is super interesting and super important. Um, okay, so there's other good good comments coming, but I, w- I don't want to lose the momentum of the story. So let's jump back. Um, we, we, these meetings happen January. It's 4th and 5th, right? And then 26th. Is that right? Yeah. And... Um, those and, are those are the the leadership meetings. My thesis is it's actually about a different set of meetings, but those are the leadership meetings that we touch on. And we'll leave that as a cliffhanger towards the end, so that people know to stay tuned for more. There's other oh, meetings. You, yeah, say that again. There are other meetings, but right. I think for most people's purposes and m- what most people are curious about is what the leadership knows. When did they know it? all yeah. of that. So that that's why we keep talking about it because the leadership meetings are the ones that have the most interest, but they also are the most tightly kept secrets. So I couldn't write a thesis on that either because I couldn't get access to those documents. <laughs> yeah. So what do we know about the format of those meetings? Like, was it just Roberts up monologuing for, for 18 hours or, or 26 hours? I believe so. Um, from the documents I could find, which were just a couple of journals, it was, yeah, that B.H. Roberts presented his documents in two full day meetings. Yeah. And then that so third, again, that third, that third day meeting was what? I think it was more Ivan saying, oh, I think we can look at it this way. And Roberts is saying, no, we can't look at it that way. But I think a lot of the guys were just like overwhelmed and tired by this conversation. And this is the, the, the 26th is the meeting where, they all basically get up and bear a testimony that they know it's true. And that's kind of when Roberts is like, Oh wait, don't okay. steal my thunder. Don't steal my thunder. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So James E. Talmadge uh, from his journal summarizes, we've got him summarizing his impression of the meeting. So this is James E. Talmadge from his journal of four, five dating fourth, the January 4th, 5th and 26th of 1922. No, oh. this is his journal. I believe from the fourth. From the fourth. Okay. Brother Roberts has this, this is Talmadge quote, brother Roberts has assembled a long list of points called difficulties, meaning thereby what non-believers in the book of Mormon call discrepancies between that record and the results of archeological and other scientific investigations. As examples of these difficulties may be mentioned, the views put forth by some living writers to the effect that no vestige of either Hebrew or Egyptian appears in the language of the American Indians or Amerins. What are Amerins? Amerins is like American Indians, I believe. That's just another name, Amerins. Another is the positive declaration by certain writers that the horse did not exist upon the Western continent during historic times prior to the coming of Columbus. Then Talmadge jumps apologist. Uh, I know the Book of Mormon to be true, a true record. And many of the, quote, difficulties, unquote, he's got difficulties in quotes, Mm -hmm. many of the, quote, difficulties, unquote, or objections, as opposing critics would urge, are, after all, but negative in their nature. Uh, what, What should they be? Anyway, he finally writes, the Book of Mormon states that Lehi and his colony found horses upon this continent when they arrived. And this is the this is the quote that made me salty at Talmadge <laughs> quote. And therefore horses were here at that time. End quote. Yeah. Is, is it not okay for me to be salty about that? Shannon? No, it's definitely circular reasoning. It's not good scientific um, reasoning. You know, it's kind of like saying, well, <clears throat> platform nine and three quarters is at King's cross station. Therefore, because Harry Potter says, it's at King's Cross Station. I know it's there, even if nobody else can see it. And I know you should it's know there. better, right? As a scientist, like, do you leave your scientist at the door when you become an apostle? Yeah. Like, actually, yeah. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> All 
Okay. So now then we have Apostle Lyman's response, uh, Richard Lyman. He's going to come up later in this presentation, and then he's also going to really come up in our discussion about the uh, the secret meetings that we'll talk about in a future episode. But Apostle Lyman's response, this comes, this is quoting your master's thesis. Um, it says, quote, Roberts reminded Lyman that at the conclusion of the 1922 leadership meeting, do you want to set up uh, the source or the context for this quote really quick? So this letter is, um, wait, let me see it again. You had it. Uh, here it is. Um, oh, this is the letter that he sends to Lyman um, where he, I believe this is the one where he's sending him the parallels and saying, remember when this happened. And um, anyway, I know you're interested in this thing. Okay. So, and we'll, we'll cover that. We'll cover that in just a second. But basically, I felt like this quote was important. Um, maybe yeah. it goes a little bit later in the presentation, but I'm going to read it here anyway. Roberts reminded Lyman, Apostle Lyman. That at the conclusion of the 1922 leadership meetings, he had announced. So this is basically recounting Robert's yeah. recollection of Lyman's response to the meeting, right? Right. He's saying, okay, remember when this happened at these meetings. And now yeah. you can say this is what happened at the meeting. So Robert's reminded Lyman that at the conclusion of the 1922 leadership meetings, he had announced that, that there were other problems beside the ones they had spoken of in the meetings, meaning that. Roberts didn't just talk about all the problems with the Book of Mormon we've already discussed. He puts the brethren on notice that there are yet more problems right. that haven't been touched during the meetings. Yeah, I think he's working on the second document and saying, dudes, we've got <laughs> you think this is bad. There's we've more. got some more. Yeah. So Lyman had then asked, quote, and this is Lyman asking Roberts, and this is so damning in my opinion. Lyman asks Roberts, quote, well, Will these additional problems that we haven't discussed yet, will these help solve our present problems or will it increase our difficulties? Closed quote. So Lyman's saying, hey, all these other problems we haven't talked about yet, are they going to make things better or worse for us? Right. Mm -hmm. Roberts replied, quote, it would very greatly increase our problems. Close <laughs> quote. Basically saying, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. At which Lyman rather lightly said, quote, well, I don't see why we should bother with them then, close <laughs> quote. Um, yeah. And then you write, Roberts responded that he would continue his studies anyway. That seems like a really important exchange in the history of all this. True? Yeah. Yeah. And Roberts mentioned it several times. Like that, you could tell it just kind of grated on him that he would just rather lightly say, then why are we going to bother if it's, if it's going to be a bigger problem than we already have, let's just not deal with it. And that was just like more than Roberts could handle. And so he brings it up in that letter. He brings it up in a letter to um, Heber J. Grant. He brings it up in the conversation with Wesley Lloyd 11 years later saying, yeah, Lyman said this thing, just flippant, and it really bothered me. Kind yeah, of. I mean, if Roberts did lose his testimony in the Book of Mormon historicity, which I think he did, this this story, this exchange with Lyman was probably a really important linchpin. Yeah, between <laughs> that and the the men getting up and bearing their testimony after all of his efforts the last several days. Well, let's read that quote. Let's read that quote right now. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I've got the quote here. Is that okay? Great. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I think it's in this quote. Let me read it. But if it's not here, I think we'll get it, we'll get to it in a second. Ro Ro Roberts, this is, so this is basically um, B. H. Roberts' letter to Heber J. Grant on January 9th, nineteen twenty-two, and it's discussing um, his disappointment over this whole conversation. Yeah. Right. This is four days after the second meeting, you know, where he's presented basically everything. This is four days after the meetings. And let's make sure we get that quote in that you were just going to tell us about, which is all the brethren bearing their testimony. I know I have it in my notes. So if I don't have it in a PowerPoint slide. That's from the Lloyd Journal. Okay. We'll, I'll pull it up. Okay. So here is what Roberts writes to Heber J. Grant. Quote, there was so much said that was utterly irrelevant and so little said 
if anything at all, that was helpful in the matters at issue that I came away from the conference quite disappointed. While on the difficulties of linguistics, nothing was said that could result to our advantage at all or stand the analysis of enlightened criticism. I was also disappointed in the results of our conference, but notwithstanding that, I shall be most earnestly alert upon the subject of Book of Mormon difficulties, hoping for the development of new knowledge and for new light to fall upon what has already been learned to the vindication of what God has revealed in the Book of Mormon. But I cannot be other than painfully conscious of the fact that our means of defense, should we be vigor vigorously attacked along the lines of Mr. Couch's questions, are very inadequate. What do you want to say about that, Shannon? Uh, sorry, I don't know how to turn it off. I hope you can't hear that. I just got a phone call. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, no, I didn't hear it at all, and don't worry about it. Okay, good, because I keep getting notices, and I, I'm afraid they're showing up, and I can't. Not, so off. just, okay. yeah. Sorry, so I missed that. I got no. a little distracted. What was the question? So, so the question is anything you want to just uh, comment on as, as we just read that quote, I'll, I'll put it back on the screen about Robert's disappointment in the discussion. In the meeting. I, I think it's pretty clear that he was just very disappointed. He's like, we're, we're in trouble. I'm painfully conscious that our defenses are inadequate this is really painful to me. And what you guys said was so utterly irrelevant that like this was worse than a waste. <laughs> like he was just so sad that they disappointed him that they didn't pull any, they didn't, they didn't help him in any way. His answers were the best they had. Nobody contributed to this discussion in a meaningful way. Um, and later, this is the quote. Uh, I, I'm, I'm basically trying to edit a slide as we talk, um, <laughs> basically. Um, and and this uh, this is super important. And I'm not going to get the source right yet, so I'm going to delete it. But I want this is the quote you were going to read earlier. Um, but this is this is basically Heber J. This is basically tell us what this quote is. This is from a conversation that B.H. Roberts had with Wesley Lloyd, who had been a missionary in his mission. They were close friends. He worked at BYU. And um, several weeks before Roberts died, he had this three and a half hour long conversation with Wesley Lloyd. And Lloyd was so struck by this conversation, he immediately wrote it down in his journal. He, like, he wrote revolutionary and then like crossed it out and said surprising. But like you could tell he was just shocked by this conversation and had to get it down immediately. So he um, that journal is a really excellent source of what B.H. Roberts was talking about in the weeks before he died. And he he tells him about this, these leadership meetings. Yeah. And and so so Lloyd basically tells us what in this quote what Roberts told him about his response to these meetings. And it says, quote, brethren had no answer, only emotion. In answer, they merely one by one stood up and bore testimony to the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. George Albert Smith in tears testified that his faith in the book had not been shaken by the question. President Ivins, the man most likely to be able to answer a question on that subject, was unable to produce the solution no answer was available. So I guess we're kind of beating a dead horse here, but this just illustrates again how disappointed Roberts was that the, these prophets, seers, and revelators, First Presidency, Quorum of the Twelve, had nothing. True? Yeah. Yeah. He was like, they just, they helped, they had nothing. Yeah. They had their testimony and that was all they could do. Okay, so now what we do is we go to Manuscript 2. Tell us about Manuscript 2 comes after these th th these 19 this January 1922 meeting, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah, it was probably finished before he left on his mission in May or mostly finished. I think he did the majority of it before May of 1922. 
And I actually found in some in 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 one place in your thesis, I thought I read that it was unclear whether this ever got presented to to the brethren. I think I read in George Smith's article that this manuscript was sent to President Grant and the Twelve on March fifth, nineteen twenty three. Right, that make sense and the first the first article written about this on the church's side by Truman Madsen, he says that um, Robert sent it in nineteen twenty three as well. So at, at first they're saying he sent this in, but then after that, they're, they're denying that anyone ever saw this. They're saying that Roberts had this document and kept it secret and nobody knew. So I think it was a way of creating plausible deniability to say he never sent this manuscript and there's no way to prove that he did. Well, actually in, in the Lloyd conversation, I believe he says he sent it, um, but the church denies that they sent it. They deny that they have either set of papers at this point. I couldn't. They told me they didn't have them. Yeah. And how credible but is the Michael church? Michael Quinn said they had them. He said he had seen them. I actually, it just felt so serendipitous. I ran into him at the church history library. He told me he had seen them with his own eyes, both of these documents. So both manuscript one and manuscript two. Right. Yeah. So, so remember manuscript one was about sort of you know, uh, the racial origins of the Native Americans. It was about anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. Uh, and it was about uh, archaeological problems and uh, linguistic problems, right? Right, so, the external evidences. External evidences. So Manuscript 2 is about what, what we can refer to as internal difficulties. Mm -hmm. Or think back to our interviews with David Bakavoy, the scholar, literary criticism. So reading the text itself to try and understand if by reading the actual text itself, we can find problems with the Book of Mormon. And um, th there's a really good summary uh, by uh, of, of the three main questions that Manuscript 2 asks, and um, they are the following. Number one, question number one, and these are so powerful that Roberts is thinking about this in 1922, 1923. Question number one, was literature available in early 19th century America, which might have served as a, quote, ground plan, end quote, which Joseph Smith could have used for the Book of Mormon. So right there, Roberts is basically asking the question, okay, if Joseph Smith didn't get the Book of Mormon, let's just theorize if Joseph didn't actually get uh, the Book of Mormon from an angel through golden plates and translate it, was was there enough information available to Joseph, you know, in 1827 or whatever, material from which he could draw to create the Book of Mormon, almost like a ground plan, right? right. We'll get to that in just a second. The second question that the that manuscript two asks is: Did Joseph Smith have a sufficiently creative imagination to have accomplished such a work? And I just ask any of my listeners who have read anything about Joseph Smith, did Joseph Smith have, uh, did he have a sufficiently creative imagination to have authored the Book of Mormon? What do we know about what Joseph Smith's own mom said about Joseph, Shannon Caldwell Montez? <laughs> he was very creative, really great at making up stories and making you feel like you were there. So yeah, sitting around the fireplace, creative. right? Yeah, he, and he was fascinated by Native Americans and, you know, their civilization and their culture. And he was always talking about this since he was a child. That he could keep people spellbound for hours. This is way prior to the publishing of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Prior to him even receiving the plates, receiving the plates, <laughs> right? He could right. keep members of his family spellbound for hours as he told stories about the Native Americans. Right. Is there any question? that he had the sufficiently creative imagination. Well, B.H. Roberts definitely looks into this. And then the third question was, were cultural traits revealed in the Book of Mormon also present in early 19th century America? And we have very little on this in today's presentation. Can you tell us what he's basically asking with that question, Shannon Caldwell Montes? I think he's saying, are some of these ideas part of Joseph Smith's upbringing, you know, like the milieu around him. Um, are people like religiously, are we talking about the same topics, you know, 
as people point out, like masonry, that shows up as a big theme in the Book of Mormon, like secret combinations. And that was a huge, huge topic in the early 19 or mid 1920s when there's this whole anti-Mason party and all of these things. So he's exploring the, the milieu around Joseph Smith at, in the 1920s. And can I just add something that's just blatantly, completely bull you over the head obvious? What's the probability that between 600 BC and zero, you know, and zero, the birth of Christ, mm -hmm. That in Mesoamerica or in, you know, amongst the Native Americans, they were talking about Jesus and baptism. And specifically and Protestant Christianity. Protestant Christianity. <laughs> that that King Benjamin is going to be giving Protestant sermons that sound an awful lot like the Protestant revival preachers that were running around the burned over district in New York. Right. You know, and talking about seeds growing in your heart. Like there were people giving sermons very similar to King Benjamin at that time. It, it's just, and, yeah. And, and anyone who's read the Book of Mormon and knows anything about 19th century American history knows that the exact sermons and doctrines and principles taught in the Book of Mormon were the exact issues that were being debated in early 19th century America um, during Joseph Smith's day, infant baptism, faith, repentance, baptism, authority, uh, right. Jesus, the resurrection, the atonement, the spirit, priesthood, all that stuff was what, what's more likely that Native Americans 600 years before Jesus was even born were talking about Jesus and resurrection and Mary and, and priesthood and faith and repentance and baptism. That or that Joseph Smith wrote all that into the Book of Mormon, which mm -hmm. is more likely. Right. And let's add that because it was so current, it really appealed to the people of the day. So when it came out, it felt so relevant because it was talking about all these things they had questions about. Like, I don't think we today can really understand how relevant it felt at the time when it came out because it just answered so many questions and just really felt like a relief to know these things that they've been wondering about. And, and that really was the value proposition of the Book of Mormon is that it answered all the compelling major significant questions theologically, apparently of yeah. the day. Right. Well, And it also, and BH Roberts actually talks about this in one of his, um, in a radio address, in 1924, he's like, how unfair is a God who does it, who requires us to be baptized and acknowledge him, but then doesn't give that knowledge to, you know, the people on this other continent. The Book of Mormon solves that problem for us. It shows that, that God is fair. So, you know, in the, in the belief that everyone has to know God and accept God in order to go to heaven, it's only fair that God presents this information to the people on the other side of the world. So he's, he's using this as an, as a way to say, you know, even if, even if it wasn't true, wouldn't we want it to be true is what he says in this um, later speech. And what does that mean to you or what can we potentially I believe? personally think it was him saying, look, whether or not Mormonism is true, it's valuable. And this is why. Yeah. So, so back to back to the second manuscript, I thought it was profound that, that basically, if we wanted to summarize what B.H. Roberts was looking into in manuscript two, it was, was Joseph Smith the translator of the Book of Mormon or was he the author? And that's so significant because in 2020, we've got Spencer Fluman, Patrick Mason, Terrell and Fiona Givens, Richard Bushman, all trying to change the narrative that even though for a hundred over 150 years the church and Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon itself and all the prophets, seers, and revelators from then to now had a unified front that the Book of Mormon was what, Shannon Montez? History. It was a history book. It it was it was and a it was translated written by ancient Americans, translated into English by Joseph Smith through the gift and power of God. That was the narrative from the beginning until recently. Yeah. And we even have B.H. Roberts saying, 
Remember that quote I read at the very beginning? B.H. Roberts saying that if the Book of Mormon isn't exactly that narrative, then Joseph Smith was a fraud and it was all ridiculous, right? Right, because that's what he says it is. So if it's other than that, he was lying. So so here we have B.H. Roberts now, you know, by, by 1922, 1923, basically asking the question, was Joseph Smith the translator or was he the author? Right? Right. Um, and And that shows that now he's seriously considering what he said before was enough to destroy the entire Mormon proposition. Right. True? Right. Yeah. yeah. He's like, oh, better figure so, this out. And so his main arguments are he, he basically draws parallels between um, the, the Book of Mormon and a book that was published in 1823 in upstate New England by the preacher of none other than who, Shannon Caldwell? Oliver Cowdery. Right. So Oliver Cowdery has a preacher named Ethan Smith who comes out with a book in 1823 called A View of the Hebrews. And it turns out there are uh, incredibly striking parallels between A View of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon. And even though modern apologists sort of create a red herring, uh, basically saying, well, clearly, if you look at the text of A View of the Hebrews, it's not the Book of Mormon wasn't plagiarized from a, a view of the Hebrews. You can't find like texts being copied and pasted in. So clearly, you know, there's no smoke, there's no fire here. But that's not the question B.H. Roberts was asking. If you go up to previously, B.H. Roberts was asking, can, can the view of the Hebrews be viewed as a ground plan for the book that Joseph ended up producing? Right. Gonna, He's not saying, is it plagiarized? He's saying, was it inspired is, by, or is there was, anyone else that could have given him ideas that he put into this book? Was the structure sort of borrowed? Did he basically take the structure of the view of the Hebrews and mm -hmm. then, and then uh, riff on it? The other things that I think it's really interesting that the BH Roberts was asking is, is the book of Mormon overly miraculous? In other words, are the types of things said in the Book of Mormon, do they just defy reason and science? I think that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final thing is, are the characters too archetypal and overly simplistic? Why are you smiling, Shannon? Um, because, yeah, that's that's a question he asked and, I, and answers. So a lot of times the apologists are saying, oh, that he didn't believe any of these questions. They're, he's just posing questions. But... If you look at the document, he's actually posing answers as well. He's, he's not just questioning. He's also answering his, his questions in this document. Yeah. And so he writes this document up and he sends it to President Grant and the Quorum of the Twelve on March 15th, 1923. I think according to George Smith, that's my, I think that's where that quote comes so from. But I According can to Truman Madsen and George Smith. Okay, Truman Madsen. And then Truman Madsen changes his story when Jack Welch gets involved, who's okay. a lawyer. Love it. Yeah. So we'll come back to that. So here is a quote from uh, from B.H. Roberts um, in a Book of Mormon study um, that uh, I think is really relevant. He writes, quote, but I shall hold that what is here presented illustrates sufficiently. So this is for manuscript two, right, Shannon? I'm not sure what document. You're... I'm pretty sure you shared this with me um, earlier today. Um, but let me just read it. Quote, but I shall hold that which is here, what is here presented illustrates sufficiently. Okay, yeah. This is the quote that you texted me earlier today that begins to strike at the heart of whether B.H. Roberts lost his faith in the historicity of the Book of Mormon. So let me show it on the screen. <clears throat> Isn't that right? Isn't that the quote you shared with me earlier today? Yeah, this is from the end of chapter three of his second um, okay. document. So this, this is how he summarizes uh, a part of this manuscript that we're talking about. He writes, but I shall hold that what is here presented illustrates sufficiently the matter taken in hand by referring to them, namely that they are all of one breed and brand. So nearly alike that one mind is the author of them and that a young and undeveloped, but, 
and that a young and undeveloped but piously inclined mind. The evidence I sorrowfully submit points some uh, will contend to Joseph Smith as their creator. It is difficult to believe that they are the product of history, that they come upon the scene separated by long periods of time and among a race which was the ancestral race of the red man of America. Now, I I kind of hackneyed read that because I haven't rehearsed reading it. Do you have any uh, additional response you want to have as to what you basically think B.H. Roberts is saying when he gives that quote? Okay, so when I'm looking at it in this book the from the papers, and I don't know if this was edited, but you're saying that evidently I sorrowfully submit some points will contend. That's not in here. It says the evidence I sorrowfully submit points to Joseph Smith as their creator. He's saying that personally. Yeah, I, I got so, that. Uh, why don't you, if you'll just monologue for me for just a second, I'm going to find the actual quote and I'm going to get that. Um, I'm going to get that in yeah, here. I'm not sure where you found that one, but um, it, from what I found or what I was reading this morning in the book that um, publishes his papers in full, that's what it says that the evidence I sorrowfully submit points to Joseph Smith as their creator. It is difficult to believe that they are the product of history that they come upon the scene separated by long periods of time and among a race, which was the ancestral red man of America. So he's just like, there's no way these are, this is all the product of one mind. Somebody's telling a story. And it's not even um, that intelligent really is what he was saying. He's like, this is a piously inclined mind, but it's pretty undeveloped, like this story he's talking about two different sets of people separated by hundreds of years. And they're so, so similar. And he also is talking about stuff like, you know, Oh, the stripling warriors being at war for two years and nobody gets, everyone gets injured and nobody dies. Like that's again, too miraculous, too much of a story to really believe as history. So he's, um, he's really got some doubts that I think are very clear there. Yeah, and I'm just correcting. I'm correcting the quote. I I put this presentation together kind of frantically. He does um, the same thing. There's another similar one where he's talking about the Jaredites and how it was just like so incredulous that again, it's just you know obviously a piously inclined mind, but you know we can't we can't just lean on miracles for everything because we don't see miracles now to this extent. So how can we believe that those were not just stories rather than actual history? Absolutely. And so is it, so when he's saying I sorrowfully, he, he says, I sorrowfully submit, right? Yeah. Is, is that basically him saying I, this bums me out to be sharing this? Yeah. I'm sorry, but this is the answer is what he's saying. He's like, I think this can be only the only answer. Yeah, the evidence I sorrow, I'm just going to read this again. The evidence I sorrowfully submit points to Joseph Smith as their creator. It is difficult to believe that they are the product of history, that they come upon the scene separated by long periods of time and among a race, which was the ancestral race of the red man of America. And he even, he even kind of insults Joseph Smith a little bit in this, right. doesn't he? A young and undeveloped, but piously inclined mind a young and undeveloped, but piously inclined mind. Oh, you know what? This is actually the quote where he's talking about the, the Jaredites. You know, he's saying the whole atmosphere of the book is a miracle, miracle. Sometimes it takes on almost childish, childish expression illustrated by the following circumstance. You know, he's just saying these are s such wonder tales. And he says that somewhere else that it's a, is this really, history or is it a wonder tale? And he's saying, I think it's a wonder tale. Like, I'm sorry to say. I, so, <laughs> and that's not him posing a question. I would say he's posing an answer. The evidence I sorrowfully submit points to Joseph Smith as the author. 
So for, for Smoot and, you know, Givens and all the people that want to say B.H. Roberts never lost his testimony, is this quote enough to conclude that he lost his testimony in the historicity of the Book of Mormon? Well, what they do is try to discount this entire document. So I believe, you know, if you're going to take what somebody says at face value, I think he is saying this personally, whether or not anyone's reading it, he is saying this as his own conclusion. They're trying to point, paint this as, no, this wasn't his conclusion. We can discount all of this. He was like a lawyer presenting a brief. He didn't actually believe any of this. This is just one-sided. He was posing questions. But I'm saying, I don't think these were questions. I think he had answers that he was posing as well. So Why I think you, you have yeah. to take him at his word. Why would he say the evidence I sorrowfully submit points to Joseph Smith as their creator. Why would he sorrowfully submit that if he didn't right. buy into it? Right. He would have no feelings about it. He'd be like, this is a ridiculous argument, but the critics are dumb. Like <laughs> that's how he would be saying it if he didn't believe it. Right. But he wouldn't be sorrowfully submitting something that, you know, he's just saying this is an unfortunate thing that we're going to have to deal with. Let's work it out. And, you know, the community of Christ did do this. So we're, you know, they also believe that all these things that he said are valid as well. Like his, his conclusions are historically and scientifically and literarily correct. Yeah. There are a couple more quotes that I pulled out of my research uh, from this morning. This is um, from Thomas Alexander's really wonderful kind of review of B.H. Roberts in the Book of Mormon. Um, it, it's published in Dialogue in 1986, volume 19, number one. Alexander writes, Roberts's analysis and synthesis suggested affirmative answers to all three questions. Those are the three questions I just referred to in, uh, um, in, in manuscript two. Again, the questions being, um, you know, is there text evidence that could have been a ground plan, meaning the view of the Hebrews? Did Joseph Smith have the imagination to do this? And were cultural traits revealed in the Book of Mormon um, uh, that were also present in 19th century America? Alexander summarizes it by saying, um, there was sufficient common knowledge of accepted American antiquities of the times supplemented by such a work as Ethan Smith's view of the Hebrews. To have made it possible for him, Joseph Smith, to create a book such as the Book of Mormon. Furthermore, quote, there can be no doubt as to the possession of vividly strong creative imagination by Joseph Smith, the prophet. So this is, uh, I'm pretty sure this is this is Alexander quoting B.H. Roberts. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So, um, so basically Roberts He's is answering these from, questions. Yeah. The study, I think from this book, cause it looks like it is on page 250. Yeah. He's basically saying it's a slam dunk. He's saying I started, I started out with these three questions and the answers are yes. The view of the Hebrews is the ground plan likely is the ground plan Two, Joseph Smith had the creative imagination and three, the book of Mormon is full of uh, 19th century artifacts. And that's something that now all, all credible ap neo-apologetic Mormon scholars are agreeing to that the 19th, that the book of Mormon is clearly a 19th century document. And we'll are probably they, talk about that more. Are all oh. apologists agreeing on that? Oh, I, that's why I said neo-apologists, right? Oh yeah. That's where, that's where Spencer Fluman and Terrell Givens, that's where the whole. Yeah. But you Mormon don't get is, like, you don't get this from the actual top. This is like the side group that they can point people to, to like, if you're questioning, maybe these guys will help, but at the top, they're still saying this is actual history. At the you top. Know, don't question it. But, but ironically at the Maxwell Institute, Spencer Fluman mm -hmm. is sitting there along with Terrell Givens when they have private meetings with people having a faith crisis, they're saying, don't think of the book of Mormon as a translation. Think of it as Joseph Smith's grandest revelation. Right. And they're having conferences at Utah state university with Bushman and Givens and Jana Reese and all sorts of, you know, neo-apologetic Mormon scholars. Right. And that's, I think, exactly where B.H. Roberts ended up. Yeah, even though in the beginning he's saying we can't prove a negative, he's saying, well, okay, even if, even if it's not true, isn't it great? And isn't it wonderful? And can't we learn so much from this? Right. And we'll get there. 
I, I'm just saying that it's ironic that the church is funding these neo-apologetic scholars to spread the gospel of the Book of Mormon not being a translation, but instead being a revelation. Right. But, but they're not yet admitting it in general conference at the top levels. Right. Or actually, I'm wrong. Didn't we have in April of 2020 a general authority admit for the first time that we should think of the Book of Mormon as a revelation, not as a translation? In a kind of a way. I think he was like, you know, this isn't who, who was this? Do you remember who it was? I don't. I don't it was, remember. It was, the, it was the Brazilian, it was the Brazilian apostle. Mm, Suarez? Uh, Suarez, right. Our listeners need to paste the quote. Um because I don't have it ready, but I, but yeah, I remember seeing someone say, don't look at this as a history book. Look at this as an inspirational, like, I think he's saying though, I think he follows that up by saying it is historical, but don't look at it for history. Look at it for spiritual knowledge. Yeah. Gerardo says it's elder Suarez. And if one of you guys can provide that quote, it's taking us off the story of BH Roberts, but <laughs> there's, it's so easy to get sidetracked. Okay. So that's manuscript two. And then what we get to finally is manuscript three, which is referred to in the in in sort of the literature as a parallel. Is that right? Yeah. And what parallel becomes is this in-depth comparison between the Book of Mormon and a view of the Hebrews. He's basically summarizing manuscript two. Um and Carson, this he's like, here's just a taste of manuscript two. And this so manuscript. Two, he's talking about, you know, as we were just saying, all of these, could Joseph Smith have written this, blah, blah, blah. The parallels is only talking about between Ethan Smith and Book of Mormon. So he's just talking about that one part of this study, what's saying, that's saying, could this have been the foundation for the Book of Mormon? So that's, that's what he's summarizing in the parallels document. Right. So, um, so he apparently he sends manuscript three to Apostle Richard Lyman in October 18, 1927. So again, the Quorum of the Twelve is is served, um, and um, and and this you know it's written that this document then gets passed around in these secret Mormon intelligentsia liberal faithful Mormon circles from 1927 to 1985. Right. Um, and I just want to read a couple quotes from a website, MormonHandbook.com has has some quotes that I think are really relevant about what B.H. Roberts says and about View of the Hebrews, because I think this is really important stuff. So here's what I wanted to share. This is B.H. Roberts. It is often represented by Mormon speakers and writers that the Book of Mormon was first to represent the American Indians as descendants of the Hebrews. That basically Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon were first to tie American Indians to um, you know, the Hebrews. Um, and then Roberts goes on to write, holding that the Book of Mormon is unique in this. And then he says, the claim is sometimes still ignorantly made. He's basically saying that it's ignorant to say that Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon were the first books out of the gate to tie Native Americans, uh, you know, to Israel. Is, yeah. is that right, Shannon? Yeah. I think I, I hadn't seen that quote. That's pretty awesome that he's like, you know, we didn't, we didn't come up with this. And that, that comes from. Nobody uh, was surprised by what, what the book of Mormon said. It wasn't groundbreaking. It was confirming what they already th thought. And that's what Grant Palmer's book and insider's view of Mormon origins. And a lot of Dan Vogel's work, it basically all shows, you know, not only was the book of Mormon not novel or not creative, if you understood the the myths about the the mounds, the Indian burial mounds, the legends about Native Americans, the racism that refused to accept that that dark skinned people could create advanced civilizations, there had to have been a light skinned predecessor to the Native Americans, right. because darkies, you know, it, it, that's an offensive term, but, but dark Native Americans could never have created these advanced civilizations. There must have been light skinned. That was all common understanding and belief in the early, you know, 1820s. Um, right, and, and it was used in order to justify the cruelty that they were doing toward the Native Americans, saying, well, you guys did this before. Obviously, you're not smart enough to have created these civilizations, so you must have killed these people. Therefore, you're getting what's coming. You guys deserve 
this genocide that we're doing because you've also done a genocide. You're not innocent. Therefore, you know, we're totally justified in this. That was like the common knowledge at the time. The whole mound builder myth was a racist way to justify their horrible actions. Right. And, and so basically what BH Roberts is saying here in this quote is that, that, this, that, that, that lots of people wrote about uh, Native Americans coming from Israel. That was just super common in the day. And when the next was quote, that? I'd what's be, that? I, would, I need to look that up. I'd well, like to know what year he said that. 323, Studies of the Book of Mormon. Oh, right here. See if you can find it. <laughs> right here. While, while, you're, while you're looking that up, I'm going to read the next one. So the next one is, um, again, Studies of the Book of Mormon, page 152. This is B.H. Roberts. For years, such materials as were then found and discussed theories as to the origin of the American Indians, including quote, the 10 lost tribes end quote theory of Hebrew infusion into the American race, together with frequent mention of cultural traits favorable to this supposed Hebrew infusion. All this was matter of common speculation in the literature of America before the publication of either priests, American iniquities, American Antiquities or the Book of Mormon. So again, that's Peach yeah. Roberts saying again that all of this Native Americans were Israelis was just the total cultural milieu and understanding that Joseph Smith was swimming in. Right, Shannon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that first quote that I was wondering about, it's actually in the parallels. It just didn't stick out to me because I haven't read the parallels as many, you know, I just was like, oh, that's what that is. So yeah, I didn't have... I didn't recognize it from there, but that's exactly where it is. It's his fourth point in the parallels. Yeah, and and so I, I I'm glad I have it in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So the, the, and then one more quote. One more quote. No, sorry. Those are all the quotes from B.H. Roberts. But then what I just wanted to do was just to kind of beat this horse dead to the, <laughs> just to pulverize this horse from this website MormonHandbook.com. They basically show a list of the parallels between the view of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon. And it's going to be hard to read visually, but you can see it visually. But hopefully everyone visually and audibly can just hear me make the list of comparisons. So this is basically showing um, uh, items that appear both in the view of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon. All right? So first of all, view of the Hebrews is published 1823, right? Seven years before the Book of Mormon is published. Secondly, where it's published in Vermont, right? Um, where was Joseph Smith born? In Vermont. Uh, Oliver Cowdery, one of the Book of Mormon witnesses, lived in Pulteney, which is where the book View of the Hebrews was published in Pultland, Vermont. He lived in Pulteney when the View of the Hebrews was published. And again, I think he even attended the church of the author, the, the, the church, the pastor of which was Ethan Smith, the author. So we've got literally Ethan Smith, a pastor in Pulteney, Vermont. Oliver Cowdery is one of the parishioners. Ethan Smith publishes View of the Hebrews, and, and Oliver Cowdery certainly would have known about it and read it. And then he saunters at some point to New York, eventually to Susquehanna, Pennsylvania, and starts assisting Joseph Smith in the translation of the Book of Mormon, could it be a coincidence that the entire foundation of the Book of Mormon, according to B.H. Roberts, can be found in view of the Hebrews? Am right. I overstating Not only case? was this book around, it had a close tie to Joseph Smith. It wasn't just like, oh, somebody published a book like that somewhere. But he, you know, you can't say he was just kind of illiterate. He never read books. He he wouldn't have known that this book was around. Books are expensive. Like it's even closer than just there was a book. It was there was a book written by Alvo, you know, thirty miles away, written by this pastor that, was, like, you've got two degrees of separation. A friend of a friend. It's not, it's not hard to find. Absolutely. Him. And so let me just go through quickly the list of parallels. Now, the destruction of Jerusalem in both books, the scattering of Israel in both books, the restoration of the 10 tribes in both books, Hebrews leave the old world for the new world in both books, religion is a motivating factor, both books, 
Migrations in a Long Journey, both books. Encounters Seas of Many Waters, both books. The Americas and Uninhabited Land in both books, that, that they come to an uninhabited land, which is actually what the Book of Mormon claims. Apologists mm -hmm. try and spin that later to get out of the problems exactly. um, found in the Book of Mormon. Settlers Journey Northward, Encounter a Valley of a Great River, A Unity of Race, Settled the Land um, of a Hebrew Race, Settled the Land and Are the Ancestral Origin of American Indians. Hebrew, the origin of American of, of Indian language, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Now I can't I can't overstate the importance here. As I was as we were talking to Robert Ridner about where did Joseph get the idea of you know uh, the Book of Mormon be, being written in Egyptian? We I hadn't remembered, and it was Dan Vogel I think who helped us remember this. But it was freaking the view of the Hebrews that gave Joseph Smith the idea to claim that the plates were written in Egyptian. It's right there in the view of the Hebrews. Right. The view of the Hebrews is saying, um, is saying, uh, you know, it contains Egyptian hieroglyphics in connection with these uh, Native Americans and, okay, and, and, you know, Hebrews. They actually say it's not a parallel. Apologists say it's not an, a parallel because Joseph Smith used, said it was reformed Egyptian. <laughs> Which is <laughs> so obviously not the same. Yeah, super dumb. Um, a couple more things: lost Indian records, breastplate, Urim and Thummim. Guess what? In view of the Hebrews, prophets. I mean that that is so significant. When Joseph tells everyone about the plates, he says what's buried with the plates is a breastplate and a Urim and Thummim. Guess what? He gets that idea from view of the Hebrews or from whatever, wherever Ethan Smith got that idea from. It doesn't yeah, really matter. Oliver Cowdery saying, oh, hey, what about this idea? Like, it doesn't matter. He didn't create it. It's not ancient. Right. It's not ancient. Prophets, spiritually gifted men, translating generational records in both books. The gospel preached to the Americas in both books. Uh, whole chapters of Isaiah are quoted. Like, I can't even believe both Joseph Smith and in the view of the Hebrews, entire chapters of Isaiah are quoted. Now, it's not the same chapters, but the idea of quoting chapters from Isaiah is in this 19, 1823 book that Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith both had access to. And yet there's more. Jesus, the Messiah, visits the Americas. Oh my gosh, the Book of Mormon. The miraculous thing about the Book of Mormon is that it claims that Jesus visits the Americas. Guess what? Joseph Smith got that from via the Hebrews or from wherever that source got the information from. That's not even unique. Um, the, the another testament of Jesus Christ. And even in the book of Mormon, when Jesus is speaking, Joseph is plagiarizing the King James version of the Bible as he's quoting Jesus. So he's not even in that case, he's clearly not translating um, golden plates into the Book of Mormon because he's simply plagiarizing the King James Version of the Book of Mormon that he has at the time. Am I right, Shannon? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we've already talked about, like David Bakavoy, I think, talked about this, how like the Beatitudes that he's talking about, they weren't around at that point. Like, Jesus and they didn't give the Beatitudes yet. <laughs> how could the Beatitudes be appearing in the in the golden plates or in the before? Or the golden yeah. Plates? Yeah, right? it's, it's, yeah. yeah. And again, good and bad are necessary opposition in all things in view of the Hebrews. Generosity encouraged and pride denounced in, in the view of the Hebrews. Polygamy is denounced in both view of the Hebrews and the freaking Book of Mormon. So even though Joseph Smith eventually practices polygamy, the Book of Mormon denounces polygamy, but that mm -hmm. wasn't even original. The view of the Hebrews had already denounced polygamy beforehand. Yeah. Um, and then idolatry and human sacrifice, sacred towers and high places, you know, Ramiumptum, anyone, right? Um, Hebrews divided into two classes, civilized and barbarous. Um, civilized thrive in art, written language, metallurgy, and navigation. This is where the Book of Mormon gets super racist because the light-skinned Nephites you know, are civilized mm -hmm. and they have art and language and metallurgy and navigation. Um, but, but of course the Lamanites are savages because dark people are savages and they can't do sophisticated things. 
government charge changes from monarchy to republic in the view of the Hebrews. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that, Shannon? It's just like a republic that was such a like American thing, you know, when they got rid of monarchy and they're like, we're going to do a republic. Like that was just such an American thing. And to be like, to have like ancient Americans creating a republic. Yeah, is democracy hadn't even been invented yet, let alone a representative republic. <laughs> right. So I mean, now, it was kind of like the Greeks or the Roman, the Greeks did this, but like it wasn't, he's presenting it in a very American form that didn't happen until, you know, the 1780s. The Native Americans so, weren't aware of Greece, right? They weren't reading right. Plato and Socrates and but, Aristotle. But their governments were based on those ideas. So, <laughs> Right. And we're beating a dead horse, but it's just so profound. Civil and ecclesiastical power is united in the same person. That's, that's in the view of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon. Long wars break. Guess what? Long wars break out between the civilized and the barbarous. Extensive military fortifications, observations, and watchtowers. Duh. That's like half the Book of Mormon is the wars, mm -hmm. fortifications, and the military stuff. The barbarous exterminate the civilized. So again, the light-skinned um, are, are exterminated by the dark-skinned. The, the civilized exterminated, exterminated by, exterminated by, by the, the dark-skinned. I'm, I'm probably not saying that right. <laughs> And then finally, um, it discusses the United States. So again, the view of the Hebrews somehow discusses the United States as some form of prophecy. Well, so does the United, so does the Book of Mormon. It prophesies of the United States, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. It talks about Ethan and Ether. It says, Ethan, Roberts noted that Ethan is prominently connected with the recording of the matter in the one case and Ether in the other. So there's even some names that, that appear to be way too similar, right? Yeah, right. Okay. So we beat a dead horse. Is there anything you want to add to that, Shannon? <laughs> no. Okay. It's, it's pretty clear that this could have been the foundation for the Book of Mormon, I would say. And, if, and, and again, if it wasn't the view of the Hebrews, it was whatever milieu the view of the Hebrews and the Book right. of Mormon came Yeah, from. the mound builder myth is not... Um, Ethan Smith's idea either. So like these ideas of a, a race that had been civilized getting completely exterminated, that was common knowledge. And so he, again, Joseph Smith was just answering the questions everyone had. These were not like new ideas that he was presenting because they were some ancient document. <laughs> these are ideas that everyone wanted to know the answers to and he conveniently provided them. You know, these supposedly ancient documents had very modern answers and very modern ideas. Yeah. And and if we just step back for a second, there's just no freaking way that B.H. Roberts is doing this in-depth analysis, basically laying out all the clear evidences that the Book of Mormon is a, is a product of a 19th century immature kind of a naive mind. And yet in his mind, it's not becoming really clear that the Book of Mormon is not, in fact, what it what it claimed to be, but instead is is a work of fiction and, and maybe an inspired fiction, but certainly not a translation. I mean, there's just, in my mind, there's no way that B.H. Roberts isn't connecting the dots. Frankly, he's smarter than you and I and a hundred of us put together, right? I mean, yeah, he put some real work into this. And, you know, we're looking at his work and being like, wow, good job. But he's the one that like put this all together and people have been trying to either hide it or bring it forward for the last hundred years. Right. So to, one final quote uh, about this, um, this third manuscript, Roberts writes, uh, it is altogether probable, probable, right? Mm -hmm. It says it's most likely that these two books, um, oh, he's talking about here, wonders of nature and providence. So He's talking about a couple books here. It is altogether probable that these two books, Priests, Wonders of Nature and Providence in 1824, which I don't know what that is, but we should probably look into that, and Ethan Smith's View of the Hebrews, first edition, 1823, and the second edition, 1825, were either possessed by Joseph Smith or certainly known by him, for they were surely available to him. Mm -hmm. This is B.H. Roberts connecting the dots even further, saying... 
we have pretty much no doubt that Joseph Smith had in his possession or was aware about both view of the Hebrews and wonders of nature and providence. And certainly Oliver Cowdery did as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And he's not even saying, Oh, it's just this one book view of the Hebrews that, um, that was the foundation. He's saying, you know, there's other books too. Like a lot of these things probably all contributed, but to think that he didn't have access and that he wasn't drawing on these seems a little incredulous. Right. Okay. So let's go back to your wonderful thesis, uh, Shannon. And I just want to talk about, again, Roberts's exchanges with Lyman. Um, because I think, I think they're relevant here. So here I'm going to be reading now from your thesis. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. So Roberts re reminded Lyman this, we've already talked about this quote. Roberts reminded Lyman that at the conclusion of the 1922 leadership meetings, now w w when is well, Robert? We already actually talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we did. But I just want to reiterate it. Um, because, because you go on and I just want to, I want to read what, what okay. right after that. So for our listeners, quote, Roberts reminded Lyman that at the conclusion of the 1922 leadership meeting, he had announced that there were other problems besides the ones they had spoken of in the meetings. Lyman had then asked, well, will these help solve our present problems or will it increase our difficulties? Roberts replied, it would very greatly increase our problems at which Lyman rather lightly said, well, I don't see why we should bother with um, them then. Roberts responded that he would continue his studies anyway. So this is, you know, manuscript two and three is basically Roberts making good on his promise, right? To exactly. continue his studies anyway. But it goes on. Your thesis says, as he, Roberts, presented a, a parallel, which is the third manuscript, Roberts told Lyman that he had indeed continued his investigations and had come upon, quote, a possible theory of the origin of the Book of Mormon that is quite unique and could be, quote, very embarrassing, end quote, if presented by, quote, a skillful opponent, close quote. Um, Roberts told Lyman that he had, quote, drawn up a somewhat lengthy report, close quote, as well as a letter of submission before leaving for his mission in 1922, but quote, in the hurry of getting away and the impossibility at that time of having my report considered, I dropped the matter and have not yet decided whether I shall present that report to the first presidency or not, close quote. Why did you include that in your thesis, Shannon Caldwell Montez? What does it tell us about both B.H. Roberts' exchanges with Lyman and kind of how he felt and thought uh, after he not only was disappointed at the results of the 1922 meetings, but miraculously a few months later called on a mission far, far away from <laughs> Salt Lake City to serve in the New York area for what, five years? Yep. What does this quote tell us? That, you know, uh, that he was really bothered by this matter. He was still trying to get it in front of people it wasn't, you know, the issues he had investigated five years earlier had not gone away. So a lot of times in order to discount these documents, apologetic sources just say, well, he just, he threw these together in five months and then put them away and didn't work on them anymore. And he went to work on his mission and he was testifying of the Book of Mormon and using that in his Book of Mormon, um, like in teaching people. So therefore he still believed in the Book of Mormon. They're trying to use his mission as proof that he still believed in the historicity. And so they kind of have to say he was unbothered by these documents. But when you see this letter in 1927, he was still clearly bothered by these issues and trying to get someone to listen. And what do we make of this quote? Um, in the hurry of getting away and the impossibility at that time of having my report considered, why would he say it was impossible to have his report considered, Shannon Caldwell Montez? I think he very clearly in January had seen a lack of interest 
And right. also maybe even a sending him away because there was such lack of interest, such discomfort with what he was saying. I think he was like, I can read the room. I know they didn't want to hear any more about this at that point. And maybe they're ready now. I don't know. Yeah. And so basically he says, I dropped the matter and I'm not yet decided whether I shall present that report to the first presidency. Right. And that's just so crazy that. And so again, on this one, when he says, I haven't decided if I should present that report, that people are wondering, does, does that mean he never sent them the documents or has he not presented it in person? Like, what does that mean? So we, again, there's some ambiguity about whether or not top leadership saw this second document and they're going to try to say that they didn't because this is definitely the most damning document, the one that he has the most strong opinions about and just kind of destroys the Book of Mormon in that second document. document. So I understand why for their own protection, the church doesn't want to acknowledge that they received this. And I'm just saying that letter is one that, you know, people are saying, see, he didn't present it. Therefore, the church never saw it. Yeah. And he's working so closely with Lyman and Talmadge. How how in the world is it possible that that the highest levels of the church weren't aware? It's just, it's, it's, it's obviously a transparent um, approach by apologists to muddy the waters to try and make things uncertain or, or am, you know, ambiguous yeah. so that they can create the, a reason of doubt for the, the credible history that shows that the brethren knew. Right. Right. And even if they didn't know about the second document, which, you know, I still don't think that is any sort of um, plausible deniability because they knew about the first one and the first one was also very damning. So, to say, oh, leadership wasn't aware of B.H. Roberts' problems, you know, whatever he presented in these papers, we, we can just ignore those because um, we, you know, they're pretty inconvenient and we want to say leadership didn't know about them. And I'm just saying leadership definitely knew about the first one. And I would say likely knew about the second one, although they never did speak to him personally about it. I can yeah, because because once you once you know it, a guy's got evidence that brings the whole enterprise down. What do you do as a corporation if you're not if your primary concern is maintaining faith and power and status and the reputation of the church, which Lyman and Talmadge and all those dudes already showed, and we showed the evidence that they showed that. Then when a when an honest truth seeker guy comes forward with information that could blow up the whole enterprise, what do you do? You freaking send him on a mission and you stop mm -hmm. entertaining, you stop giving him audience. Right. Will this greatly improve our problems? Yes. Okay. Well then stop. Stop. Right. <laughs> and go yeah. on a mission. Right. Yeah. Just go. Let's give you some busy work. Let's let's give you something else to think about. Because clearly there's nothing better for Roberts to do at this point than to go on a mission. Right? There's no <laughs> one else that can, there's no one else that could be mission president for the next five years, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think both sides were kind of relieved to have him gone. I think he was kind of frustrated and annoyed. And I think he will actually, my friend's um, grandfather was in B.H. Roberts' mission and, and she showed me a letter where he was just, he had to go to Salt Lake and he was kind of depressed trying to, you know, having to kind of associate with all the people in Salt Lake. Like, I think it had become kind of, a problem like it was hard for him to be around these people because he was feeling hurt by the lack of attention that he was that these problems were getting and the way that they kind of were shunting him to the side and treating him as a problem rather than the issues he was bringing up absolutely okay your your wonderful thesis goes on to say as he presented a parallel roberts told lyman that he had indeed continued his investigations um, I haven't read this yet, right? He indeed um, continues investigations and had come upon a possible theory of the origin of the Book of Mormon that is quite unique and could be very embarrassing if presented by a skillful appointment. This is where Roberts told Lyman that he had drawn up a somewhat lengthy report as well as a letter of submission before leaving for his mission. Oh, I'm sorry. We just yeah. read that. Okay, next quote. Forgive me. Quote from your thesis. It seems that Roberts could tell that the general authorities were not ready to listen to more of this information before his mission and was aware of the fact 
that the mission call may have been a way to interrupt his studies, redirect his attention, and remove him from sight. Five years later, he was still wrestling with whether or not to present the second paper to church officials and hope that Lyman would offer clarity of assistance. So what you basically are saying there is you, you feel like Roberts wondered whether he was sent in exile, right? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think he, I think everyone knew when he was being sent, why he was being sent. I don't think that was really a question. I think they were kind of like, why don't you go cool off and go do something else? Right. You want to write, he ex Roberts explained to Lyman that if the question arose as to whether or not Joseph Smith used view of the Hebrews to provide the structure and some of the material to the alleged Nephite record, it would quote, be greatly to the advantage of our future defenders of the faith. If they had in hand a thorough digest of the subject matter, I submit it to you. And if you are sufficiently interested, you may submit it to others of your counsel. Let me say also that the parallel that I send you is not one fourth part of what can be presented in this form. And the un unpresented part is quite as striking as this that I submit. So what, what can we take from that, Shannon? Yeah, first of all, he's calling it alleged Nephite scripture. So he's, um, and he's saying, look, what I have is just a tiny taste. Like it's not even a fourth. And if you're shocked by this parallel, know that everything else I have to say is just as shocking as this. I mean, striking, maybe st shocking is adding a little more emotion, but he definitely found it striking, kind of hard to ignore these parallels and saying we, you know, I still believe that we need to be looking at this. Right. And again, how significant is it that he says uh, alleged Nephite record? Why would he write that? Right. If he believed it was historical, he would just say this Nephite record. Right. This historical Nephite record. <laughs> or, But when he's saying alleged, it just adds a little bit of doubt, right, to the historicity. Absolutely. Okay. So um, what, what happens then, and this is kind of where this story concludes, Tell us about the relationship between B.H. Roberts and Wesley Lloyd. So Wesley Lloyd was a missionary in Roberts' mission. They stayed close. They were good friends. He ended up becoming the dean of graduate studies at BYU. And he also actually went to divinity school after this conversation with Roberts. But several weeks before Roberts died, he and Wesley Lloyd had a three and a half hour con long conversation about a lot of things, but um, at some point it turned to this episode. And Lloyd was so struck by this conversation, he wrote it down as quickly and as accurately as he could. And um, so that's where we got a lot of insight as to what B.H. Roberts was thinking here at the end of his life. So, you know, we had 1922, his papers say this, 1927, he's still working on this. And then 1933, he's talking to Wesley Lloyd, he's still beating this drum that we have a problem here, we need to talk about this. I'm feeling hurt that I was ignored. This is what, um, I mean, these are kind of all the things that his, uh, this conversation touches on. Okay, perfect. So as we talk about B.H. Roberts's relationship with Wesley Lloyd, Wesley Lloyd uh, was a former dean of the graduate school at BYU. He was a missionary under Roberts in the Eastern States Mission. You've said a lot of this already. Robert met with Lloyd weeks before his death in 1933, spent three and a half hours talking. And as you mentioned to us earlier, Lloyd was so taken back by this conversation that in August 7th, 1933, he wrote it all down in his journal, correct? Right. So this was, this is something that he immediately went and wrote down. And again, this is in 1933, uh, the same year that, that Roberts dies. And right. here is some quotes that I pulled out from your thesis quote, the conversation. And this is, this is Lloyd writing, right? Yeah. The conversation then drifted to the book of Mormon and this surprising story he related to me. 
And I want to point out, he actually, in the handwritten note, he said this revolutionary, and then he crossed it out and said surprising. So he kind of was like, holy crap, wait, that's maybe a little strong. I'm going to say surprising. Because maybe I think revolutionary meant he didn't really believe it. He's just surprised that Roberts did. And there's so much fear. Like, I, I know this today. Like, I'm aware of a general authority that lost their faith before they died. Um, you know, now, and, and this person recently passed away. And, when, you know, it's, you know, this guy didn't come clean. He, he was Grant Palmer's general authority. And, you know, so this is the person that met with Grant Palmer several times before Grant Palmer died. Mm -hmm. Gave Grant Palmer all this important information. He, to the whole world presented himself until his death as a believer. Um, and his wife did too. And he told Grant Palmer, you know, we're afraid for our pension. We're afraid at the social repercussions if we come clean. So this general authority and his wife, until the general authority's dying day, publicly maintained they believe, but they were so afraid of the social and the financial consequences mm -hmm. of being honest that, they, that, that this general authority um, kept this secret to his death. And right. so, you know, apologists want to say, unless a general authority publishes in the Deseret News, which they'd never publish, the church is a fraud, then it never happened. But what you have to understand is, is that these guys are afraid. They're terrified at the consequences, not just for themselves, but for their posterity and their legacy if they come clean. So I think right. this, is a this is a closely held secret because he knows he saw the reactions of the people in the room when he said this. He knew how people would feel if he was too open about how he felt. So this became something that he had to struggle with privately. Absolutely. And this this was a very close friend that he had this conversation with. This isn't something he was going to go tell everyone. Absolutely. So, uh, so Shannon, you write the conversation then drifted to the Book of Mormon and this surprising story he related to me. So this is Lloyd saying, Lloyd recorded that Roberts told him of writer's letter and of his assignment to answer it, how he had been stumped and asked for help from the brethren. Roberts had then presented his findings to the general authorities only to be disappointed. In answer, they merely one by one stood up and bore testimony to the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. George Albert Smith in tears testified that his faith in the book had not been shaken by the question. President Ivins, the man most likely to be able to answer a question on that subject, was unable to produce the solution. No answer was available. Now, this quote we read earlier in today's presentation, but I think part of what's important about this is, is that is that is that um is that Lloyd is basically in his story, isn't all the evidence we have of the actual historical record, doesn't all the evidence corroborate Lloyd's account of right. what Roberts told him? The fact that he he names Ryder, like that's, the, you know, Ryder's just some random guy from Logan who, who, you know, may not even be that active 11 years later if we look at the questions he's asking. And then again, his response to B.H. Roberts' letter was like, well, what about the Negroes and the priesthood? So like, he was obviously questioning a lot of this. So the fact that he can name Ryder and say, oh, well, he got a letter from Ryder. That's like indisputable. So there's no way that this that Lloyd could have this knowledge without B.H. Roberts giving it to him. Right, because because Lloyd didn't have dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, and Shannon Caldwell Montez's <laughs> thesis, and right. the, you know the notes and the diaries from Talmadge, and he wasn't going through the B.H. Roberts papers saying who is this writer guy, what is this letter, like. B.H. Roberts is like, this guy, the writer, sent me a letter and about this. And there's just no way that he would know this without Roberts telling him. And the fact that he writes it down in freaking 1933, right? Like right, that, right when it happens. Yeah, right, right when it right happens. Right after it happens. And again, this is stuff that Smoot and, and Givens and other neo-apologists are trying to dismiss and downplay and make irrelevant. And I think right. it's I think it's incredibly relevant and credible. True. Right. Right. Yeah. What he says privately sometimes matters more than what he says publicly. I was telling a friend recently, you know, no matter how often President Trump says he's the most 
a wonderful person that women can ever know and that he respects women, if he privately says, you can grab them by the pussy, we're gonna, that's actually really concerning. The private words should not be discounted. That's not the whole story. You can't just look at public words and pretend like that's the only thing that matters ever, not just in this situation. Right. So, um, so going back uh, to continue what you write in your book, um, Roberts told Lloyd that, quote, there was, however, a committee appointed to study this problem consisting of brothers Talmadge, Ballard, Roberts, and one other apostle. But again, Roberts was disappointed. They met and looked vacantly at one another, but none seemed to know what to do about it. Again, Shannon Colo Montes, is he naming, you know, the right apostles there? Um, actually, Ballard was not part of that, but yeah, he is named that we know of, yeah, that we know of. right, that we know of. So, Ballard, it could have been, but you know, again, does it really matter if every single detail is the right ones? There was a committee of apostles that met together, Thomas stared vacantly it. at one another, and said, That's What right. what should we do? Yep, they met and looked vacantly at one another, but none seemed to know what to do about it. So these are prophets, seers, and revelators all kind of going, eh, eh, yeah. I, I don't know. What, what do you think we, do? we should do? What do you think we should do, Hiram? I don't know, Joseph. So <laughs> um, so uh, finally, Robert said he had attempted an answer, but it was one that would satisfy people that didn't think but a very inadequate answer to a thinking man. So here Roberts is basically saying, I've got an answer, but it won't satisfy a thinking man. It would only satisfy people who didn't think. And yeah, this committee- It only looks good on the surface, but if he digs a little farther, it's not going to hold up, is what he's and the, saying. And the committee said they just, and, and so it go, Roberts goes on to say, they decided it was, quote, about the best they could do, end quote, and voted to adopt it. So here we have Roberts telling them we've got a bad answer. It's an answer not for thinking people. It's an it's mm -hmm. an it's a it's an answer for non-thinking people. And you've got apostles going, that sounds good. Any yeah, answer is well, better than no answer. That's what right? we could do. Right. And we actually have the letter that he sent. So again, this corroborates with the evidence that yeah, they sat around, they came up with an answer. Obviously, Roberts wasn't pleased with the answer, but it was the best they could do. And so he sent this letter to Cow to Mr. Ryder. So right. you can see that that did happen. Absolutely. And then you go on to write, after this, Brother Roberts made a special Book of Mormon study, treated the problem systematically and historically, and in a 400... So this is, again, this is Lloyd, right? Mm -hmm. What he writes about his conversation with Roberts, correct? Yes. So Lloyd's writing, after this, Brother Roberts made a special Book of Mormon study, treated the problem systematically and historically, and in a 400 typewritten page thesis set forth a revolutionary article on the origin of the Book of Mormon and sent it to President Grant. Now, when he refers to a 400 page uh, thesis, what does he mean by that? We, are we talking about the He's three? He's talking about both studies because there was manuscript 141. And manuscript yeah. And then... Uh, I don't remember the page numbers. Numbers are the worst. <laughs> was that parallels included? Was that all three? I, yeah, I, parallels, I believe, was also included that if you add up all the numbers and maybe one or two of the letters, like cover letters, would be. Um, so I don't Robert, know. So I mean, Robert actually, in this one, the 400 typewritten pages, I think, is more of an estimate. There's another source, um, I think one from his secretary or a cover letter that says it's about 400 pages. And again, um, in, 19, exact number. in 1933, none of this stuff had been made public, correct? Right. Yeah. So how is, would Lloyd know that Roberts had written 400 plus pages on all these problems? Only if Roberts told him. Only if Roberts told him <laughs> and told him the year he died. Right. Yeah. So, um, Treated the problem systematically and historically, and in a 400 type written page thesis, set forth a revolutionary. And that's you said it, it did say what before revolutionary? Um, well, that was scratched out, right? Revolutionary. Yeah. Was scratched yeah. Out. Well, revolutionary was actually earlier. This one right. is, this one he keeps in revolutionary. Okay. 
a revolutionary article on the origin of the Book of Mormon and sent it to President Grant. It's an article far too strong. And I need to pull up uh, the actual quote here. It's an article far too strong for the average church member. So here's this elitism of the brethren get to know one set of facts, but the average church member, they can't know. They can't handle it. They can't handle the truth. They We've got to hide it from them, right? Mm -hmm. It's an article far too strong for the average church member, but for the intellectual group, he considers it a contribution to exist in explaining Mormonism. He swings to a psycho. This is like probably the most important part of the whole question about whether B.H. Roberts lost his testimony in the history of the Book of Mormon. Is that right, Shannon? I would say yes. <laughs> okay, here it is. So this is Lloyd recounting what Roberts told him. He swings to a psychological explanation of the Book of Mormon and shows that the plates were not objective, meaning they weren't real, they weren't material, but subjective with Joseph Smith. That they his exception. Go ahead. What? <laughs> they were in his head. They were subjective. They were. So this is what in, Roberts yeah. tells Lloyd that that the plates were not objective, but subjective with Joseph Smith. That his exceptional imagination qualified him psychologically for the experience which he had in presenting to the world the Book of Mormon, and that the plates with the Urim and Thummim were not objective. He then explained certain literary, and that makes sense. Why? Because Joseph never produced the Urim and Thummim or the breastplates, and no one saw them. And when people saw him translating translating the Book of Mormon, what was he using, Shannon Caldwell Montez? Not a breastplate. Was he using a breastplate with spectacles and a Urim and Thummim? No, what was, was he using? Yeah. A rock and a hat. The same freaking peepstone that he had used to treasure dig, to deceive mm -hmm. people into thinking that he could find buried treasure when he never, ever found any buried treasure, ever, ever. The same pursuit that he cries, apologizing to Isaac Hale, Emma's dad, saying, I'm sorry for these foolish things that I've been doing. I promise I'll stop. The same stone and hat that he used in the, in the deception of so many earnest, foolish farmers in upstate New York, takes that same peep stone and, and translates or produces the Book of Mormon. Now B.H. Roberts is admitting that there never was a Urim and Thummim, that there never was a breastplate, but instead he used the peep stones. He goes on to say, he then explained certain literary difficulties in the book. These are some of the things which has made Brother Roberts shift his base on the Book of Mormon. Shift his base on the Book of Mormon. Instead of regarding it as the strongest evidence we have of church divinity, he now regards it as the one which needs the most boltering, bolstering. So by B.H. Roberts' death in 1933, he shifted from saying the Book of Mormon is the strongest evidence we have that the church is true to the one artifact that needs the most bolstering. Mm -hmm. His greatest claim for the divinity, the power of the prophet Joseph Smith, lies in the Doctrine and Covenants. So that basically says that by his death, Roberts was saying, no, 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 it's not the Book of Mormon that's the great witness of Mormonism. It's the Doctrine and Covenants. Anything well, you want to say, it's Shannon, Joseph about that? Smith being a prophet. That's the that's the message of Mormonism that Joseph Smith was inspired. But to say the Book of Mormon is our greatest proof because it's archaeologically, you know, it's ac an actual history of ancient Americans. That is, he no longer believes that that's the reason that the Book of Mormon is true. He's saying that. The best evidence we have for more, the best reason for Mormonism is Joseph Smith. And you can see that from, you know, nobody's claiming that he's in the DNC, nobody's claiming that he's translating. So that's going to be our easiest one to use to prove him as a prophet because he, here he is just speaking directly to God. So I think that's cooler than this translation that's pretty iffy. So tell me this when disingenuous, deceptive, and these are my words, I'm not putting them in your mouth. When disingenuous, deceptive, uh, dishonest apologists like 
like Stephen Smoot, um, read this quote and still maintain the B.H. Roberts never lost his testimony in the history, uh, historicity of the Book of Mormon. How do they justify those deceptive and dishonest arguments? Well, they try not to read this quote, first of all. Second of all, I've heard it said um, he was really sick. He was old and sick, and he was probably just feeling cranky and critical. They probably caught him on a bad day. Um, they kind of say this kind of thing. Just, um, I don't think we can trust him because he was old and tired. <laughs> I don't, I honestly don't know. I think what they say is, well, that's only one account. Look at, they'll gather every, um, every speech he ever gave in which he would say the word ancient and use that as proof that he still believed it was ancient. Do, but they, what pull, I do they pull sources from before 1922? Sometimes, the but then there are, they do that for sure. But then once they get called on it, they're also like, I mean, Stephen Smoot that you were talking about, that's what he did. He pulled it after 1922, every like speech he could find where he mentions the Book of Mormon. And especially if he says the word ancient um, and, and acts like it's history, then in every, that's what they say. Oh, look at all these dozens or even hundreds of times that he referenced the Book of Mormon in the final 11 years of his life. But again, I'm kind of thinking if I was to talk about, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of that podcast, Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. They, you can get like sacred ideas from fiction. And I think that's kind of where B.H. Roberts was at this point in his life. So if he's saying, you know, if, if I was talking about Harry Potter and I'm saying it's about magic, I wouldn't, it doesn't necessarily believe that I think it's magic. But so if you're saying this is a book about the ancient inhabitants of America, it doesn't necessarily mean that he believes they are ancient and that it's an actual documented history. I, I don't know. I haven't, I honestly have not read every word that, um, that they present as him believing. I kind of feel like it doesn't matter what he said publicly as much as, you know, I don't think you can discount what he said privately. And what he said privately, I think, often tells a more accurate story than what he said privately or but publicly, as you were just pointing out with this other supposed faith losing general authority. What they said, or, you know, as I said again with Donald Trump, like what they say privately, sure, you can say that they believe that as well, but to completely discount what they said privately is very. I would say unethical if you're actually trying to look for true historical knowledge. And I would imagine that like apologists do, they often try and attack uh, the, the critic or in this case, can we call Lloyd even a critic? Was Lloyd no. like a disaffected anti-Mormon? Like, what No, he stayed active his whole life. He worked at BYU. He um, was, you know, as I said, the Dean of graduate so like studies, he was, He's he's not a critic. He and he actually he didn't even go public with this journal. He wasn't going around telling everyone this. This journal also came to light after the B.H. Roberts papers and they started interviewing people like. So the other thing they do is they find quotes from people who knew him and say, well, how did he talk to you about the Book of Mormon? And I think it's in this process that they discovered that Lloyd had a journal. He's like, oh, yeah, no, he actually thought this way and I actually have this journal and they're like awesome let us see it and and that's what it says so there are a couple of quotes of people who knew him and they they also draw on <laughs> there's one quote that's super dramatic by a Jack Christensen that that's what the apologists lean on and it happened to come forth after these papers come out or well they're not published but after the these papers are known to exist after there's been photocopies of them put into the church history or into the used library. And there's this one quote by Jack Christensen that's like, B.H. Roberts pointed his finger in my face and said, you better believe it. And Ethan Smith had no part of this. It's just like so dramatic and so like 
it, it, it's hard to believe that this, uh, this other source that's not written down, that's recalled 50 years after the fact, is more accurate and more reliable than the one that was written down at the time and preserved like as it happened in a lot more reliable way than quotes taken 45 years later by people who already knew that his belief in historicity was being questioned. And this, so, is, yeah, and this a good is the problem. This is, you know, this is the, this is the, the crazy, um, uh, thoughts in T I, I I'm, I'm having a hard time collecting my thoughts, but this is the, the mind F I'm going to say mind F <laughs> that has been perpetrated on us as Mormons because we're trained and nurtured from infancy to doubt and question any, any statement that would ever be negative, that would ever make us feel yucky, that would ever, was ever written by a critic of the church or a liberal or any, um, unauthorized source, right? And you're supposed yeah. to only believe trusted sources and church leaders and stuff published by Deseret Book, et cetera. And so, um, but the problem is, is that the truth is it's oftentimes the people that got mad at the church who were the most credible, like going all the way back right. to William Law and the Nauvoo Expositor. If you go read the Nauvoo Expositor and what William Law wrote there, he was in the first presidency. What he wrote in the Nauvoo Ex Expositor was like 99.9% .9 true. Joseph was secretly practicing polygamy. And yet what the church has conditioned our minds to do is to not trust anything from anyone who ever left the church or had any doubts or was liberal or was progressive or whatever, when usually it's those sources of information that are most true. Right. And then the flip side is apologists tell us, Dallin H. Oaks tells us, Lyman told us, Talmadge told us, Joseph Fielding Smith told us that that they go with their feelings and if the evidence ever conflicts their feelings conflicts with their feelings they're going to go with their feelings every single time and so smoot and givens and bushman and and peterson and molstein and gee and nibley and joseph Feely, all the apologists including you know talmage and and all those guys they're not credible at all. Smoot's right. not credible. He's the opposite of credible because they tell you where they begin. They begin with their conclusion that it has to be true because I felt it. And then because yeah. I felt it and because I've, I've concluded that it's true, I'm going to find any specious, non-credible, fraudulent, pseudoscience, shoddy historical logically fallacious and broken arguments to try and salvage the church's reputation and it's in, in the historicity of the book of Mormon or the book of Abraham or the church's truth claims. And instead of just going, Oh my gosh, BH Roberts was a stud. He was a man of integrity. And this Lloyd guy had every reason to tell the truth. He was faithful and he freaking wrote it down in 1933 immediately after having the actual conversations with Roberts Therefore, Roberts must have lost his tes testimony in the histories of the Book of Mormon. Okay, let's deal with it. Right. They attack me. They attack you. They attack Roberts. They attack Lloyd, or they defend Roberts and dismiss Lloyd, whatever they've got to do to fool and deceive the church membership. And I'm tired of it. It's been a right. hundred years that we've known about this stuff. The Book of Abraham crap came out in 1912 in the New York Times. And we're still just learning about this now in 2020. It's driving me crazy that the gaslighting is so successful and that the dishonest apologetics continues. Stop right. at Terrell Givens. Stop at Richard Bushman. Stop at Patrick Mason, Spencer Flume, and Stephen Smoot, Daniel Peterson, John Gee, Kerry Molstein. Freaking stop gaslighting the members of the church. They deserve to know the truth. B.H. Roberts lost his testimony of the historicity of the Book of Mormon. Deal with that instead of a smearing me and, and deluding and confusing and deceiving the general church membership. Right. It's, it's intellectually dishonest. And that's, 
honestly, that's why I've I've realized recently how the head of the historical department is almost always a lawyer, not a, like Richard Turley, 30 years as the church historian or the executive director. He's a lawyer who does history, not a his historian, because as a lawyer, it's fine to present one side of the story. It's not ethically questionable to only present the information that works for your side. As a historian, that is definitely ethically irresponsible. It's bad history work. So I, you know, I, I see that they have reasons to protect themselves, but it is dishonest the way they're doing it. And it, you know, I feel like Roberts was trying to show them a way that they can have both. You can believe in the Book of Mormon, you can believe in Revelation, you can believe in whatever you want, you can still have value in this, but let's be honest about it. Because if it's, if it's not true, it's weak. And it, it, it's easy to debunk, and it can really send people sideways. I think there's thousands of us who have been in that situation where when you believe it's 100% true, you, when you believe you've been lied to, that's a much harder thing to overcome than to believe that you were mistaken. It's the, I can believe that they were wrong in the past and that they made mistakes, but we're currently good and we're doing good things and I want my kids to be raised this way. But when you feel like you're being currently lied to, it gives you no place to go. And I think a lot of us are upset because we've been left with no place to go. There's no acknowledgement that this is what it is and this is how they, there's just, so when you find this out, there's, there's no recourse. You can't talk about this at church. You can't talk about this to your parents. You can't talk about this to your spouse because they might leave you. Like it's, it's doing so much damage by not being honest. So I can say that they can love the church but if they're with the dishonesty is harming people, they need to figure out a better way. And I feel like B.H. Roberts was really trying to do that. And that's why I love him for this. But at the same time, 100 years later, we're actually having the exact same conversation. Nothing has been has been improved. In fact, it's been made worse. Because when I look at back in 1922, when Roberts is saying we can't prove, we can't rely on the ability of inability to prove a negative, we can't say, well, you can't say there's no flying spaghetti monster, therefore, it's possible that there is one. Like he, the way he had, he approached the issues, and I was looking at his book of Abraham, the way he approached that issue was much more straightforward than you would see today. And I can, I, I really personally believe that it was this episode, these papers, this, these meetings that undermined the confidence that they had in the early 1920s in the, in the strength of the church. And since then, it's gotten more brittle, more secretive, more toxic, more destructive because they can't, they're not talking about the glory of God as intelligence. They're saying, well, intelligence is important, but you know, there's, there's always a, but, but, but behind what you feel the is the most knowledge. important, what you feel, right? What we right. condition you to feel is what's important. The truth is expendable, right? right? Facts and evidence and the truth and science and factual, credible history, they're all expendable. What matters is the feelings that we've conditioned you to feel. Right. And that only, I believe, happened in the wake of these meetings. I mean, there's always some like, you know, you have to talk good about your leaders and things like that. But there was never, there was always this belief that the history and the knowledge and like that Mormonism is just adding all knowledge. You're bringing together all knowledge. If it's good and it's true, it's part of our theology. That's not really how they talk about it anymore. And so part of me feels nostalgic for these days that B.H. Roberts was in. And even Talmadge, I feel like, was kind of in that. They were trying to push it that way. But by the 1930s, it had not gone that way. And it was starting to take this other direction. I'm getting grief. Well, most of the listeners are like applauding at, at, at this exchange between us. Um <laughs> Uh, and I've, I've been sharing on the video excerpts from some of the quotes. Uh, so, you know, 
just imagine viewers and listeners, like lots and lots and lots of really affirming quotes. I do, because we want to be fair and uh, objective, I want to share uh, a comment of a, of a viewer who's being critical. Uh, Brent Smith, we welcome your criticism. Brent writes, well, John posts my comment that yelling doesn't help. Who will be persuaded by the ranting? No one, in my opinion, who is the audience? Brent, in some sense, you're right. Uh, yelling and anger usually creates a backfire effect. On the other hand, I my audience is not Orthodox Mormons who are never going to listen to this in the first place. My audience is truth seekers. I, I, I My audience is people that want to know the truth. And Brent Smith, I'll just give you my opinion. If there is a viewer or a listener right now that is seriously, earnestly, sincerely trying to find out the truth, I guarantee you after listening to two hours, 44 minutes, and 54 seconds of my exchange with Shannon, they have been provided with evidence that, that will be persuasive to them about the things that we discuss. So yes, I'm angry. Yes, I'm passionate. Yes, I'm tired of this. That's my passion coming through, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to apologize for it. And I don't think it harms uh, our ability to reach out to the audience that we care about. We care about truth seekers. And if you care about evidence and truth and history and science and facts, I'm pretty sure my passion's not going to dissuade you from, from even handedly considering the things that Shannon Montez and, and all the other scholars have been sharing with us about B.H. Roberts. But thank you, Brent, for the criticism. Uh, I hope you'll continue providing your criticisms here on Mormon Stories Podcast. Um, okay, Shannon, let's go ahead and finish uh, reading from your thesis. We're almost done, listeners. We're going to be able to wrap up, I think, by three hours, mm -hmm. um, which is really a land speed record for Mormon Stories Podcast, as far as I'm aware. Um, you go on to write in your beautiful thesis, Shannon, uh, called The Secret Mormon Meetings of 1922, quote, Lloyd's journal entry confirmed many of the details that would only be known by Roberts. So that's, again, making the point that Lloyd's account is credible because he, it, because how else would he have known all these details that weren't more broadly available? You go on to write, written at the time of their conversation, it gave many new details, such as the reactions of those in the leadership meetings. It said the second study had been submitted to President Grant and indicated that Roberts wanted intellectuals to have access to it. It also confirmed that Roberts did not believe in the historicity of the Book of Mormon but that he maintained belief in Joseph Smith as a divinely inspired prophet, which, by the way, Stephen Fetching Smoot, none of us ever claimed differently. Uh, none of us ever claimed that Joseph, that Beatrice Roberts lost Wasn't his faith in the whole That Mormon. he would have been the new, um, you know, this. he didn't write a CES letter. He wasn't trying to work against the church. We never have said that he's the apostate poster boy. But that's what apologists do. They create these fake... Uh, red herring, specious arguments to try and distract listeners and viewers from the real arguments that are happening. Yeah. And if if I I don't think anywhere I said that B.H. Roberts lost his faith in Joseph Smith or the church overall. If I did, I'm saying right now, I never meant to say that. That was a mistake, but I don't think I said it. But what's more conspicuous and more relevant is the deceptive gaslighting tactics of people like Smoot and others to present uh, an argument that none of us made and then to knock that down. That's called a right. strong man argument. Yeah. It's a classic uh, logical fallacy. It's dishonest and deceptive. And freaking Stephen Smoot, you should be ashamed of yourself um, for what you've done and continue to do, along with Gee, and Wolstein, and Peterson, and Midgley, uh, and and all the other apologists that, that are deceiving us generation across generation. So um, to go back to your wonderful uh, prose, um, uh, yeah, so it also confirmed that Roberts did not believe in the history of the Book of Mormon, but that he maintained belief in Joseph Smith as a divinely inspired prophet. We're not saying otherwise. Lloyd's shock at the story and the effort he made to write it down in as much detail as possible showed that this news was startling, even revolutionary, to him and would likely be so to other church members. Right. Anything you want to add to that, Shannon Caldwell Montes? Um, no, I... Do you want me to pull that quote back up? Are you looking was, at it? Hold on. Um, no. 
Are you looking up something different? Yeah. I, so I was remembering um, some of the quotes that, that, so as I was trying to say, I, I found a lot of evidence that I believe that um, B.H. Roberts lost faith in addition to this, um, this journal entry and some of the conversations he had with other people. One of the things that I was looking at was his like, his personal notebook that he was keeping quotes and things in. And there was a quote by Abraham Lincoln. And I, let me see if I can find that, but it was basically like, um, I mean, there were several quotes that talked about um, how important it was to be true and to have your faith on things that are true and not to have faith in things that are not true. So let me, um, you go ahead and monologue for a minute while I, I find that one. But it was it was just so interesting, some of these other quotes that he was using in order to kind of remind himself that what he was doing was right. Do you have them or do you want me to monologue for a second? Um, hold on, I think I actually found it and I'm opening it. Um, shoot, sorry, go ahead. I'll just read a couple quotes. Oh, um, here I found it. You got it? <laughs> yeah. So um, he says, it, this is his thought book. And on the first page, like the title page, he Whose writes. book is it? it? This is B.H. Roberts' personal like notebook that he writes down quotes and things. Got it. And so some of these I just thought were so telling. So the Druid's Prayer, O oh God, grant thy protect protection. In, and in thy protection, strength, and in strength, discretion, and in discretion, justice, and in justice, love, and in love, to love God, and in loving God, to love all things. Um, and then here's one that he wrote down by hand. It says, and it's a quote from the Washington Herald from April 30th, 20, 1927. And it says, just feeling sure that you are right, but being un unable to give reasons for your stand helps little when, and then underlined, the grounds for your beliefs are questioned. Um, there's other ones, God, thou art love, I build my faith on that by Pericles. Um, he says, oh, the Abraham Lincoln quote one that I thought was so great. And this is his script, personal scriptural reference book. And he has it in this book. Abraham Lincoln quote, he says, I am not bound to win, but I am bound to be true. I'm not bound to succeed, but I am bound to live up to what light I have. I must stand with anybody that stands right, stand with him while he is right, and then underlined, and part with him when he goes wrong. I just thought that was like really telling that he's like, I have to do what's right, and I have to stand for right and, and things like that. There's another one. Um, from his lecture notes, to be if um, to be effective, this is underlined. To be effective, faith must be coupled to truth. And then he has in parentheses, if you plant gunpowder, it will not bring forth gunpowder plants. And that's a quote from Orson Pratt. And then he underlines again, belief in error not effective to salvation. So again, he's saying, you know, our beliefs have to be true in order for them to be effective. We can't just do it on feeling. He's saying, you know, faith on something that's not true is a problem. It's pointless. And that's where it's almost unfair to call B.H. Roberts a Mormon apologist, because what we've learned from Mormon apologists from New Hugh Nibley in the 60s on is that they don't care about the truth. They literally care about putting forward whatever specious garbage they can put forward to try and create, uh, you know, to try and cast doubt on anything that would cause doubt mm -hmm. and to try and bolster the faith. But what B.H. Roberts believed in is that, that the truth needs to be the bedrock of the foundation of faith and that faith built on untruths is, is bad, weak, uh, flimsy uh, faith. Right. And so, yeah, and so that's why I even feel bad calling B.H. Roberts an apologist because Peterson, Nibley, Gee, Mulstein, you know, uh, 
you know, Smoot and all those apologists have given Mormon apologetics such an awful, horrible name. Um, uh, and that's what makes B.H. Roberts a hero in my book, even though I don't care if he maintained his faith. That's great. He was willing to follow the evidence evidence where it took him. And, and he, uh, as, a, as a matter of personal courage and integrity and sacrifice, he spoke truth to the church leaders as, as far as he could until the point where they said, we don't want to hear this anymore. Mm-hmm. And even then, he tried to pioneer a way to make it work without a literal belief. He kept talking about the virtues of the church and why, you know, even if it's not true, as this um, radio address from 1924, even if it's not true, one would hope that it is because this is what it provides. And this is why it's good and valuable and adds to the canon of Christian belief because it makes God look more fair and it makes God look more loving. And that's what Mormonism does. It adds a new aspect to Christianity that makes it more complete and more beautiful and more full. And that's why I love Mormonism. And I think that's where he kind of landed on this. It's like, again, I feel like it's it's beautiful and that Joseph Smith must have done something amazing by bringing this forward. That's why I'm going to recognize him as a prophet. But again, I think he was inspired rather than... Um, bring then as a translator of actual documents. I don't think he was a translator. I think he was an inspired prophet is kind of where he took that direction. And I'm fine with that. I think it can be proved if, you know, it can be believed that he was inspired, but to make it try to prove that he was a translator is a much different exercise and much harder to maintain. And this, this is, I think, a great segue. Uh, I'm, I'm showing a quote by Alyssa. She says, this interview just lit a serious fire in my soul. Mm-hmm. We're glad to know that, Alyssa. And that's why Shannon Caldwell Montez is so amazing. Um, and B.H. Roberts was so amazing. And all the scholars in freaking dialogue and Sunstone and all the different scholars that helped make all this possible, they're so amazing. This is a great segue because while we're going to conclude right now our, our discussion about Uh, B.H. Roberts losing his faith in Book of Mormon historicity, we still have, and don't go away because we, I have to conclude, but what, what I want listeners and viewers to understand is that we're not done yet. Shannon Caldwell Montez, we still haven't gotten to the core of Shannon Caldwell Montez's thesis, which is about these secret Mormon meetings that happened after B.H. Roberts leaves his interactions with the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve disenchanted. He calls together some of the top uh, non-leader intellectuals that you can find, scientists, physicians, scholars, to try and come up with better answers because clearly the prophet, seers, and revelators weren't able to come up with any. So uh, what we're going to be covering in our next conversation with with Shannon caldwell Montes, and I promise we will, Shannon, is... Uh, the nature of those meetings and biographies of the people who participated in those meetings. Um, uh, Anything else you want to say about that before I conclude with some important stuff about B.H. Roberts? Um, I would say, you know, regardless of any interest in this thesis and the people that were in these meetings, I think it's enough to just say that these meetings were held on some level. I, I think these meetings are one more proof that B.H. Roberts was seriously concerned and was looking for answers. So, you know, anyone saying this was just a lawyer's brief, these documents, you know, he didn't actually believe, he wasn't actually troubled by this information. It just is one more evidence that what he was saying, he was, he really meant, he was actually concerned. These documents need to be treated as B.H. Roberts' own words and his own concerns. And to do otherwise is is dishonest. Yeah, and and um, again, what's I think is super important that we'll cover uh, in the next session is that the limited geography theory and this catalyst theory that is used previously for the Book of Abraham is now being used for the Book of Mormon uh, in neo-apologetic circles by Bushman and Givens and Mason and Fluman and others. 
you know, this, all of this originates from BH Roberts and his meetings with these Mormon intellectuals. So what's crazy is we've got, you know, current, you know, people like Blake Osler or, you know, again, Terrell Givens or Spencer Fluman say, or, or, you know, whoever advances the limited geography theory, all these people nowadays acting like that's something novel or innovative. It's an apologetic response. All this stuff comes out of BH Roberts's meetings with these intellectuals. And so again, I'm just kind of repeating what you already said. Why would Roberts develop um, a, uh, a catalyst theory for the book of Mormon if he thought it was historical, right? Yeah. Why would he, why would right. he develop that theory at all? <laughs> exactly. Right? He doesn't. Yeah. And, w and why would he develop a limited geography theory um, if he didn't see it deeply problematic? And by the way, the thing that kept him from embracing a limited geography theory, which I don't think he ever did, was that Joseph Smith himself had had made revelations and declarations that the Lamanites uh, covered, covered all of the Americas. Right? right. It was only in this 1921 meeting that they were like, wait a minute, this can't work as far as the geography fits, one of the guys in there was a map maker. And he was like, this, you know, we can't put this down over the whole continent. It's gotta be smaller. And so that was, that was really the first time that was ever really acknowledged, I believe. And so again, all, all of these issues are coming up in the 1920s. And that's why I think this is such a fascinating time to look at. And that's yeah. why I feel like it's a valuable exercise to go through this meeting, these meetings and understand what happened and how it affected change from there on. Yeah. And S. Vance writes, B.H. Roberts also pioneered uh, the Joseph used both the Searstone and the Urimum Thummim argument. The church adopted this in their 2013 Gospel Topics essay. They are still channeling Rod Roberts. And that's interesting because they're channeling arguments from a guy who mm -hmm. lost his faith in the history of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. The, the and final honestly, thing. I wanted to say one more thing. Please. As you were kind of going off on the neo-apologists, I actually have no problem with neo-apologists. I think they're doing what BH Rob, they're doing what should have been done a hundred years ago. They're trying to create a space that people can be both intellectual and Mormon. But the problem is that this they're also seen as a side gig. They're not the mainstream of Mormonism. In fact, they're only there on the very last stop out of the church. If the top leadership would acknowledge this a little bit more and just make a little more room, you know, then the people like my bishop wouldn't be telling people that if they don't have a literal belief, they can't have a temple recommend. This needs to come at the top. It can't just come from these guys being paid in this little institute to answer a few questions for people as their last stop effort. So I think what they're doing is valuable. I just think it needs to be done at the top and not on the side. And I, you know, I, I, you know, I was talking to my dear friend, David Bakavoy the other day. And he, you know, I'm like, aren't you ever mad at Givens and those guys? And he's like, no, they're, they're like a, they're a way station. They're a soft landing for people to leave the church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, he, I think he finds them valuable for other reasons, but, but I have three concerns with neo-apologists uh, at least I have several, but here are the three, why I do think that they're dangerous and harmful in many ways. That doesn't mean that they aren't good people. I think these are, you know, Mason, I know Mason, he's a nice guy. Blumen's a nice guy. Bushman's a legend. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't know many people that think Givens is a nice guy, but that's another story. Anyway, but, but the three things that, the three things that uh, concern me about neo-apologists. One is that there's a lot of people, let's just say an LGBT youth that is thinking suicide, right? If, if they had all the factual information about the church, when they're 17 or 18, before they decide to go on a mission, before they decide to get into a mixed orientation marriage, before they have kids and commit their whole life to the church, to then realize that, you know, they were gay all along and should have never made any of those decisions and should have run from the church and pick any other people in a mixed faith marriage where a doubter now is getting divorced from his believing spouse because he lost his faith. There's so many ways the church hurts people. Mm -hmm. But if the people were given the information and a credible objective spin on the information, they would be able to make informed decisions that then would prevent them from subsequent harm. 
Right. That's what's needed. And if the extent to which neapologists delay or postpone people being able to see the church for what it really is, see the history for what it really is, see the truth claims for what they really are, such that they then commit themselves to a Mormon life that then ends up in catastrophe, I think they're doing harm. That's one. The second thing that they're doing is they're creating this duplicitous uh, speaking out of both sides of your mouth Mormonism where the brethren keep to keep, get to keep spewing an orthodox version of Mormonism in general conference, but then they're secretly and silently in these secret little conferences that you only get a special invite to get to give a totally different version of Mormonism. That's duplicitous. That's mm -hmm. not honest. So they're, participate, they're participating consciously, knowingly, in a duplicitous approach to deceiving the membership. Because we should all be on the same page. It shouldn't be that the general membership hears the orthodox view and then elite, secret, privileged, um, special, connected people get to hear this more nuanced, advanced version. That right. The whole and that's actually my point is the top needs to be saying this, not exactly. the givens. Exactly. So that's, so that's one problem with neo-apologetics. The second is that they... Um, yeah, the, sorry, that's the second problem, the duplicity. The third problem is the lack of accountability. What neo-apologists right. do is instead of the brethren being held to account for deceiving us, for misleading us, for gaslighting us, for punishing, you know, sincere, correct, thoughtful scholars, for smearing their names, for excommunicating them, from, from keeping for them from keeping getting them out of their daughter's weddings. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Instead of the <laughs> brethren being held accountable for the deceptions and the punishments and the violence that they've conducted on scholars, academics, thinking people, whatever, apologists are carrying water for the brethren, um, propping up their authority, propping up their claims for our money, for our time, for our devotion, without calling for any accountability. Yeah. They're not saying, Bush, Bushman's not... Bushman's not saying, hey, brethren, you misled our members. You need to fix that. Bushman's quietly saying in a secret little group of, of privileged elite Mormon intellectuals, uh, the, the narrative that the church has been teaching isn't sustainable because it's not accurate. And then when it's actually made public on YouTube and he's called on it, he backtracks and says, whoa, everybody's misinterpreting what I said. That's number one, yeah. duplicitous. And number two, it's not holding the brethren accountable for the harm that they've caused for over a hundred years. That's why I have a problem with neo-apologists. And that's why I think they're actually in many ways causing harm, even though they're good people and even though they do yeah. good things. I'm thinking it needs to be done, just not as a side project. This is the whole church needs to be held accountable. And this isn't something that they can just pay someone on the side to do. And yeah, it does do harm when it's not being acknowledged at the top and on the entire, on the level of the entire church, everyone in the pews should know things or at least know that you can't just make it so black and white. And that the person who's doubting isn't actually doubting. They just have a different point of view. It's fine to have a different point of view. That's what needs to happen. Um. You know, I, I can't incorporate all the amazing comments that we're getting on uh, YouTube and on Facebook. Oil Stories writes, I ignored my 15-year-old self that this was all BS and hypocrisy, only to find out the same thing 30 years later. That's mm -hmm. just one of, think of all the divorces from mixed faith marriages. Think of all the LGBT suicides. Think about all the depression, all the anxiety, all the trauma mm -hmm. that Mormons have experienced thinking that they were part of something that was true, signing up for something that they were taught was true when the actual factual historical narrative of what they were signing up to was fraudulent and mm -hmm. intentionally deceptive from over a hundred plus years ago. That's again, why I think. Yeah. It's like too late. They've heart. been, they've been being apologists for a hundred years and it's created these situations where marriages are at stake and people are committing, you know, dying by suicide over the, the cognitive dissonance that arises when your life is based on one thing. They've taken it so far from reality that when people are trying to bridge that gap, it creates a lot of damage. And so again, I think Roberts was the hero here in that he was trying to keep us on solid ground 
And they chose to reject that solid ground and go on feelings. And then a church that's based on feelings is pretty weak. And you can't, you know, you can't talk about things. And you can't even have a real marriage because certain things are just supposed to be kept quiet. Everything stays very surface level if you're not allowed to dig deep. Amen. A couple comments. Jerem writes, I'd love to see an episode about how we know the church pays apologists and how that all works. That's super important, Jerem. When we think about the church funding Daniel Peterson, funding Hugh Nibley, funding John Gee, funding Carol Muelstein, um, uh, funding the Maxwell Institute, and funding Givens, and funding Bushman, and funding Fluman, uh, and even buying academic seats like you know, the chairs at Claremont or the chairs at Utah State, you know, they're only they're only existing because the church funnels money into these endowed chairs, and the church makes sure that only faithful, supportive people fill those chairs. And someone like Michael Quinn, who in every sense deserved to sit in some academic chair somewhere to be, uh, you know, a scholar of Mormon studies, the church blackballs and, and derails Michael Quinn and then make sure that Kathleen Flake or, or um, you know, Patrick Mason or Fluman or whoever, Barlow, um, Bushman, they get to sit in the endowed chairs because they're willing to carry water for the brethren. Mm -hmm. I think, Jerem, that would be an amazing episode to sort of peel off the cover of how the church for over 100 years has funded through nonprofits, through back backdoor money, through freaking... Through BYU. What's that? Through BYU. They BYU. just give him a and, job as an Egyptologist, and then he's getting paid. And also Saints Unscripted and the YouTube channels that are coming out now, and freaking Kwaku L. Like the church continues to flood the world with money to pay for gaslighting its members. And that needs to be uncovered. And uh, Jeremy, I'm, I'm really glad uh, you called it, um, called us on it. Okay, I'm, I'm really uh, stirred up here. Um, yeah, and Adam Jacobson writes, case in point, the More Good Foundation. For those who want to know, the More Good Foundation is a nonprofit that is funneling money to Saints Unscripted, that's funneling money to Fair Mormon, uh, to uh, you know, Book of Mormon Central, to Book of Abraham Central. You know, the church gets super wealthy donors to fund these nonprofits that then gaslight the membership. And uh it, when do it they even need donors? They've got a hundred billion dollars of liquid asset funds that they, you know, it's like of course they have the money to put into this and they have the money to lose if people leave. You know, we, we stop paying thousands of dollars of tithing. Like every person they lose is a problem for their bottom line. And I mean, they're definitely motivated to not keep people finding this out. But, but now it doesn't matter because with $120 billion in probably $200 billion in assets, mm -hmm. if they just make 7% on their money every year, which is pretty easy. They can, they easily have more than enough money to cover the annual budget. So in truth, the Mormon church doesn't need the tithing anymore. They want it, right. but right. they don't need it. So just let's come clean. Let's try to be a good organization rather than the truest truth that I've ever said that was true. Like, right. it's fine. Like, we don't have to maintain that that unmaintainable thing that it's historically accurate. I it's mean, the church not. is going to keep doing it, but it's fundamentally dishonest. Well, and, and that's yet, what causes the damage. And the, the fact that they lie and people believe them. And then when someone finds out it's a lie, the damage that it causes in those families and those relationships, it's their fault. It's not the person who finds the truth that's the problem, but they're treated as such. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'll share one last quote from our listeners and then I'm going to read, and we're going to end with BH Roberts in this episode. Uh, Oil Stories writes again, the only way to combat the church funding their apologists is for us to fund the truth seekers, truth tellers, and truth preservers. Like she says, John Lynn, thank you, Oil Stories. Jonathan Streeter, Dan, she says, John Vogel, she means Dan Vogel. I would add uh, Shannon Caldwell Montez. <laughs> I would add, you know, Sunstone. I would add Dialogue. I would add, um, freaking RFM, Radio Free Mormon podcast, Lindsay Anson Park, your polygamy. Um, you freaking people, if you care about this stuff, if you believe in it, if you want to see the gaslighting to stop, donate. I will fund Shannon Caldwell Montez. If you donate to Mormon Stories, I will pay Shannon Caldwell Montez to keep doing research on Mormonism. 
And we can, all her work so far is completely voluntary. I'm right now willing to set up a Shannon Caldwell Montez fund through the Open Stories Foundation. 100% of your donations will go to funding Shannon Caldwell Montez's research. And we'll bring her on Mormon Stories regularly. And we'll, we'll, we'll have her share her research with the world. We'll create YouTube videos. We'll fund her publishing stuff with signature books or with the Mormon History Association, whatever. We need to fund truth because the only way to fight the gaslighting that apologists do is to fund truth. So donate to Mormon Stories podcast at mormonstories.org. Donate to Radio Free Mormon, to Bill Real. Donate to Lindsay Anson Park. Donate to Sunstone. Donate to Dialogue. And fund projects that will specifically, here's the thing I just want to end with. I'm sorry we're talking so much. My mind has been being blown because of you, Shannon Caldwell Montez. Yeah. But one thing we have never done in the history of Mormonism, and I was talking to RFM about this this morning. It's blowing my mind. This stuff was like top of mind amongst Mormon intellectuals in the 80s and 90s. Like Dialogue and Sunstone published infinite articles about B.H. Roberts and all this stuff. Not infinite, maybe 10, but okay, a lot. <laughs> still, they were really great articles. Not only was it never, did it never penetrate the Mormon consciousness at all, but freaking thoughtful intellectual Mormons have forgotten it. So that we're here in 2020, all of us learning this crap for the first time when the research was done 20 or 30 years ago mm -hmm. and where these documents have existed for over a hundred years. So what we need in Mormonism is, is not, not we, we do need more scholarship, but we need something more than scholarship. We need people who can deliver the scholarship to the common Mormon. That's why Jeremy Runnels was so brilliant. That's why Grant Palmer was so brilliant. That's why RFM is so brilliant is because we need people that can communicate the scholarship to the membership. Because if it just stays in dialogue, if it just stays the pinheaded Mormon academic liberals talking about this at lunch and at tea, it's never going to have an impact. And that's why I'm starting a freaking YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is called Understanding Mormonism uh, with Dr. John DeLynn. Go right now to YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Understanding Mormonism with Dr. John DeLynn. We are going to be creating short 10-minute video snippets that can be shared with youth, that can be shared with missionaries, that can be shared with young adults, that can be shared with 20-somethings and 30-somethings, seminary students, high school students. We need to communicate the truths of Mormon scholarship, Mormon history to the masses of Mormonism. And that's why I want your support for the YouTube channel. Go subscribe, support us, and pay attention because we're going to be um, releasing that YouTube channel in the coming weeks and months. Huge shout out again to Jonathan Streeter and Gerardo and others and donors to Mormon Stories that has made all of this possible. Shannon, I'm so sorry for my effusiveness. I just can't control myself. No, and it's I get it. Fault. <laughs> well, it's fascinating information and it's, it's so much fun to talk about. And it's, I think it's the Mormonism that we could have had. And that's why I love it because I loved being a Mormon. I loved, I, I'm honestly still heartbroken that there's no place in the middle, that there's no place between literal belief and apostasy. So like, Again, as I was saying, if the top leadership would acknowledge this, and if the, every bishop knew that this was an issue, it wouldn't it wouldn't be such a, a like a disaster anytime somebody found out the truth. So I I think you're right that the more we talk about this and the more accessible this information is, the more that it's going to have to just become mainstream, and that it doesn't do the amount of damage that it's done at this point. Amen. Several listeners and viewers are saying they love the passion. Brent Smith says, I hope your YouTube snippets are more controlled. They will. <laughs> the YouTube snippets will not be rants. They're going to be me in a poised, uh, thoughtful, hopefully engaging way, just sharing the truth and the information. So Brent Smith, thank you for keeping us honest today on Mormon Stories. Uh, and Shannon, before we end with the quote from B.H. Roberts, uh, is there any final thing you want to say about B.H. Roberts and, you know, uh, his loss of faith in Book of Mormon historicity or anything else we've talked about today? I No, I think we've 
covered it. We've kind of, this is the second one we've done about this basically. And again, this wasn't my thesis, but I definitely did do a lot of research into this. And I just think it's undeniable that Roberts had a shift in his belief and to do, to try to prove otherwise is difficult and dishonest. But I think he's a good example. I don't think we need to throw him aside. I think he's actually one of the best examples of what a thinking Mormon should do. So stop gaslighting the members, Stephen Smoot and Daniel <laughs> Peterson and Fair Mormon and the Maxwell Institute and Terrell Givens, by the way. I had someone share with me that Terrell Givens, when he runs around talking to B.H. Roberts, says that B.H. Roberts didn't understand the issues in depth enough and that he was basing his beliefs in the Book of Mormon on a faulty premise, which was that uh, you know, uh, Lamanites covered Lamanites and Nephites mm -hmm. covered America from the tip of North America to the tip of South America. B.H. Roberts knew the issues, Terrell Givens. He just also knew that Joseph Smith had made a prophecy which precluded the possibility of the limited geography theory. And he was intellectually honest enough to note mm -hmm. that and to consider it um, and, and to make it so he couldn't then reduce the Book of Mormon happenings to a super small geographical area so tiny that it could never be assailed by critics, which and is that what took apologists do. 50 years to develop. When he when he found this out, there was no limited ge geography theory that he could fall back on. He's saying we can't fall back on a limited geography theory for these reasons. You know, this there there are but Joseph Smith's own words preclude us from saying that there can't that this was just a small group of people on a otherwise inhabited continent. They thought they were alone, but they weren't. He's, you know, he's he's saying that that can't we can't fall onto that. And for them to be able to say that there's a limited geography theory and to try to make it mainstream, it's only because of this hundred years of being able to undermine the the and to, the whatever continental theory that um, that they can even make that argument now. It wasn't even a possible argument for Roberts at the time. So to say that he didn't understand is kind of ridiculous. It was the only thing that they could fall back on. And it's, again, it still should be because that's what Joseph Smith was talking about. It's intended to be the history of this entire continent. So Stephen Smoot, Terrell Givens, Spencer Fluman, Patrick Mason, uh, Richard Bushman, you know, John Gee, Terry, Mul Terry Molstein, stop gaslighting. No, them. I would say Russell M. Nelson, Dallin H. Oaks. I'm not going to even put it on those guys. They're not the ones responsible here. The ones that are responsible are the ones at the top. They are the ones doing the damage. These guys are following behind the cart, trying to put band-aids and, you know, trying to help people who have been damaged by this. But those guys are driving the cart that's running over people and they're letting it happen. I don't care who's behind the cart being a nurse and helping out. That's not the problem. The problem is the people at the top driving this cart that is running over people, causing damage, and they won't acknowledge it. And I know it would take, it would damage things to acknowledge it suddenly and fully, but that's not our problem. The, the problem is that they won't acknowledge it at all and they need to be more honest. And these guys are trying to be a little bit more honest, but it's not their fault. It's the guys at the top that are really causing the problems. Yes, they may be keeping people in longer than they should. The people at the top are the ones that are really the ones that need to own up and to be honest. Amen, amen, Shannon. I, I, I do think the neo-apologists know better Right. And I do think they should. I think those guys at the top know better too. It, yeah. They can so, have the plausible deniability and pass it off on these guys. They can say, oh, well, we're, we're not intellectual. That's not our business. We're about the spiritual side. There's no way they're not acquainted with some of these issues. There's no, just no, no. no way. Not only are they acquainted with them, they've been acquainted for them for over a hundred years. Right. And have consciously and systematically suppressed, withheld, hid information and punished anyone who talked openly about it and mm -hmm. misled the members. And we're talking right. about Gordon B. Hinckley. We're talking mm -hmm. about Talmadge, Woodstow, Joseph Fielding Smith, Ezra Tap Benson, like 
Everyone. Jalen H. Oaks, Russell M. Nelson, Boyd K. Packer, Bruce R. McConkey, they're all in on it. Right. They're all in on it. And, and you're that's right. what I'm saying. They are the problem. They are part of the problem. We're not going to the let them problem. off the hook. They don't get to be invisible here. They don't get to be innocent here. They are not invisible and they're not innocent. They're the ones that could fix this problem and they're not. Amen. Preach it. Preach it, Shannon. Preach it. <laughs> I'm mad. All right. Uh, lots of, lots of listeners are chiming in and, and, uh, agreeing so many great conversations. I've loved this platform, um, today, this, uh, stream platform again, thanks to Jonathan Streeter for making this possible. Thanks to Gerardo for improving the visual look. If any of you like the technology we're using, the updated visual, the updated audio, please support Mormon stories podcast, go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor. We use that those donations to pay for me, my time uh, to to pay for this equipment, to pay for the internet and the services and the new camera and the lighting, just to make the experience better. Please support us. Uh, your donations make a lot. I'm going to again repeat, we are starting a YouTube channel called Understanding Mormonism. Please subscribe to it. Please have your friends subscribe to it. I will start a, a Shannon Caldwell Montez Research Fund uh, if you, if you want to donate to that, reach out and Shannon, how would you like to make a little bit of money for your research? That'd be awesome. There's, I was just thinking yesterday about, you know, this other project that I would, uh, I, this alternate idea I had for my thesis, this guy kind of related to BH Roberts, who's doing like PR and all of this, like there are so many things, so many directions that we could take this. It's really exciting. I love it. And so what I want to do now is end as we began. I think this is super important. I'm going to read what B.H. Roberts said in 1909. And this is going to be a repeat, but I think it's a really important way to end. B.H. Roberts said, if the origin of the Book of Mormon could be proved to be other than that set forth by Joseph Smith, if the book itself could be proved to be other than it claims to be, then the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its messages and doctrines must fall. For if that book is other than it claims to be, if its origin is other than that ascribed to it by Joseph Smith, meaning a translation of golden plates given to him by an angel, right? Then Joseph Smith says that which is untrue. He is a false prophet of false prophets, and all he taught and all his claims to inspiration and divine authority are not only vain, but wicked. And all that he did as a religious teacher is not only useless, but mischievous beyond human comprehending. That's the first point I want to make, which is that B.H. Roberts himself is making that argument. And I'd be curious to present that quote to him now, knowing that he concluded that the Book of Mormon wasn't historical how he still retained a belief in the divinity of Joseph Smith and the church, because that seems to be contradictory to uh, his previous position. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's a very strong example of black and white thinking. You know, it's all true. It's all false. It's all good or it's all bad. I think there's room. And I think he realized later that there's room in the middle for good that, that you know, truth without a capital T and good without a capital G that there is, you know, good things that can come out of religion as long as it's not so dogmatic and that it's not causing harm. So I think, I think he became more nuanced, but I definitely think he uh, had a black and white view at that point. And if he was to hold the church to those standards, then I think he would have realized that Joseph Smith is mischievous beyond understanding or whatever he said. It's like the worst of the worst. He's a terrible person, which I wouldn't actually argue against <laughs> knowing more about the history of Joseph Smith. Really quickly, before I give the last quote, Alan Mount is asking, can we include a note for Shannon in our donation to help her continue? Yes. What I'm going to do is set up an actual dedicated donation account for Shannon through the Open Stories Foundation, and we're going to start raising money for you. If, Shannon, you accept that uh, offer. Do you accept well, that offer? 
Sure. I have not found a job since graduating. It's been a few, only a few months, but COVID and all that. So this would be an awesome job. I'd love it. And I don't think BYU is going to entertain your candidacy. No, I, I talked to them at the church history library and I'd have to have a temple recommend. And so that one's not going to happen either. Okay. All right. Great question, Alan Mount. We love you. Marriage on a Tightrope. Check it out. Uh, donate to them as well. Um, I'll end with this final quote um, from uh, B.H. Roberts. And this is for freaking Stephen Smoot, Terrell Gibbons, <laughs> Russell Daniel Nelson. Peterson, Russell Nelson, Dallin freaking H. Oaks, anyone who's an apologist for Mormonism and anyone who wants to respond to this interview with Shannon Montez, Cald Caldwell Montez, to my interview with Robert Rittner about the Book of Abraham, here is B.H. Roberts' words to you, freaking Mormon apologists. Those who accept the Book of Mormon for what it claims to be may not, and I'll say the Book of Abraham, I'll say the Doctrine and Covenants, I'll say Mormonism, may not so state their case that its security chiefly rests on the inability of its opponents to prove a negative. Why? Because it's impossible to prove a negative. And that's what apologists nowadays rely on. They try and get people to prove a negative. Prove that Joseph Smith didn't talk to God. Prove that there weren't golden plates. We can't prove there weren't golden plates because Joseph never produced them. They mysteriously were taken up can't by an angel. Something but, that didn't exist. <laughs> but that's the world that apologists live in. Prove that plates didn't exist, right? Prove that a scroll, a longer scroll, didn't exist for the book of Abraham. That's what apologists do. And even B.H. Roberts would say that's dishonest. Stop it, Mormon yeah. apologists. He goes on to write, the affirmative side of the question belongs to you, uh, apologists, who hold out the Book of Mormon to the world as a revelation from God or as a translation from God. The burden of proof rests upon you in every discussion, for not only must the Book of Mormon not be proved to have other origin than that which we set forth, or be other than what we say it is, but we must prove, you must prove its origin to be what you say it is, and the book itself to be what you proclaim it to be, a revelation from God, a translation of ancient plates. To be known, the truth must be stated, and the clearer and more complete the statement is, the better the opportunity will the Holy Spirit have for testifying to the souls of men that the work is true. SOS to Mormon apologists and Russell M. Nelson, the Holy Ghost will not bear witness to lies, to deceptions, to vapid pseudoscience Mormon apologetics. So from the words of B.H. Roberts, stop it. The burden of proof is on you to prove that your claims are true, not us to prove uh, you know, negatives that are impossible to disprove. And good right, feelings Jane. are not proof. Feelings are not proof. Amen. I couldn't have said it any better. All right, Shannon Caldwell Montez, will you come back and discuss your thesis with us? <laughs> yes. We've been teasing that for a long time. So well, people, if people still want it, I'll still do it. Again, I mean, it did get, you know, thousands of downloads on, um, you know, once we talked about it, it looks like there was quite a bit of interest. So I'm wondering if everyone who actually had interest has already figured out about it. But maybe for the people who don't want to bother reading this huge document, we'll, uh, we'll try to make it a little bit more succinct and just talk about it. Well, I'm just going to tell you my biggest fear, Shannon Coldwell Montez, is that you're going to go get a PhD. I know that's probably <laughs> really good for you, but I would rather see you helping us take Mormon history and truth and scholarship to the masses because the last thing we need, and I'm not telling you what to do, and I hope you <laughs> get that if you want it, but the last thing we need is another dissertation that gets put on a shelf, never gets read, another book published by an author, and and generations of Mormons remain unaware of the basic truths of, of Mormon history. So yeah, if we can pop that Mormon bubble and make this something that people would listen to and be open to, and then we could somehow reduce the damage. I think that would be amazing. 
So I'm, I hope you'll work with me, uh, Shannon Caldwell Montez. I'm working with uh, RFM radio free Mormon. If any of you want to volunteer to help us, we need help creating these short videos. We need other cool Mormon stories, podcast episodes. So please reach out at Mormon stories at gmail.com and, and let us know how you can help because we need an army of people to spread the truth, to keep future current and future generations from being gas lit. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it. That's the work that we have today. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Shannon, you'll, you'd be happy to know that this is the largest live audience we've ever had on the history of Mormon stories podcast, really? or at least close to that. We reached close to 500 simultaneous viewers throughout most of this uh, presentation. Nice. And this platform has been amazing. So <laughs> listeners and viewers, thank you. And Shannon Caldwell Montez, bless you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Please keep up your work and please join us again soon on Mormon Stories Podcast. Happy to do it. It's fun. All right. Thanks, Shannon. You're awesome. All right. And uh, and listeners, please donate to Mormon Stories Podcast at mormonstories.org. I'll be putting up a, a post a link in this post allowing you to donate directly to Shannon Caldwell Montes if you want to to support her research um, but please also could donate to Mormon Stories podcast and uh, with your donations we'll be able to keep this programming going we'll be able to start this YouTube channel and we will we'll be able to do much more in the 15 years that we've been alive we'll do much more in the 15 years ahead with your ongoing support because technology is going to make that even more possible. So thanks everybody. We love you. Stay tuned. I'm so excited and, uh, and, uh, stay tuned for more cool episodes of Mormon stories podcast in the months, weeks, and years ahead. Bye everybody. Take care, Shannon. You're freaking awesome. <laughs>